Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Entitled Mom loses it because I bought a car she doesn't know how to drive. So I was talking to my husband and this story came up. He said I should share it here. To start off, this happened almost 8 years ago, so dialogue might be off a bit. So little backstory. My mom has a bad history with cars. She breaks them down within 2 years of getting them, no matter the condition they're in when she buys them. She cannot take care of them. When my older sister bought her first car at 19, my mom would borrow it for appointments and trips constantly. And by the time I was 18, you could tell she drove it. Well, I saved up money for six years, working hard to get enough for the car I wanted. And my grandpa even pitched in when I turned 18 and graduated high school with better grades than my sister. My grandpa went to the dealership with me and looked at Ford Focuses because that's what I wanted. Then I saw it. A five-speed, two-door Ford Focus. And I loved it. Why? Because my mom couldn't drive a standard. I smiled. So we get it for a steal at four grand up front. Then we drive home and the following conversation ensues. We've got me, we've got entitled mom, and we've got awesome grandpa. And we've got entitled sister. Me. I got my car. They run outside to check it and are admiring it and smiling. Entitled mom. Wow. Hey, can I borrow it sometime? Me. No, you can't drive stick, mom. Entitled mom is shocked. What? But how are you going to learn to drive it? Awesome grandpa. I'm going to teach her. Entitled sister looks angry. She can't drive stick either, and I know she planned to use my car since entitled mom damaged hers. Entitled sister. But you can't take a driving test with a standard. They don't allow that. Grandpa. Yes, they do. Now stop whining. It's her car, not yours. Unless you two were planning to take it from her. Entitled sister and entitled mom look nervous. They would never admit it to awesome grandpa. He'd kick them out. And since they lived with him at the time and were broke, that wasn't a good idea. Entitled sister. Of course not. I just worry about my baby girl. That's all. Me. Sorry, but no one is driving this car but me and awesome grandpa. I can't wait to learn. Over the next week, they glared at me and hated that I was learning. Mom asked Grandpa to teach her at one point, and he said it was up to me since I had the only standard car. Nope, my car. I had that car until I was 22 when my husband crashed it due to avoiding a drunk driver. Best little car I ever had. Oh, and Entitled Mom still can't drive a standard. Edit. Oh my gosh, guys. I went to bed and you all blew this up so fast. Because it was mentioned a lot in the comments, I'm going to put it here. Yes, I live in America, and when I said my mom was bad with cars, I did not mean gas and a mess, though she does make a mess. I meant that she actually drives like a nutcase. Examples are she rides her brakes constantly, forgets to turn the car all the way off, leaving the battery to die, doesn't change the oil, ever, expects others to repair it for free, takes shortcuts through roads that destroy your tires, drives as fast as she can over tracks, destroying the tires and the alignment. And she lets her friends in the car, and any car she drives that has no respect for her or the vehicle. My sister had stains on her passenger seat from one of the friends mom helped. I hope this clears things up a bit on why I was so eager to get a car she couldn't drive. Also, my grandfather had a rule. Keys always went on the key rack. Spares stayed at home in case you locked yourself out of your car with your keys inside it somewhere, and he could come and get you and save us from spending money to get the keys out. I used to work with a guy whose parents were constantly using his new vehicle. They never returned it with any gas in the tank. It was always dirty. He traded it in for an even nicer one, but with a manual. He was the only person in his family that could drive it. Have you ever had someone try to use your car without permission? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Oh, I can't stand people that just take your stuff without asking. Am I the jerk for telling my brother-in-law's girlfriend she's boring because all she talks about is her job? I'm 34, female, and my brother-in-law's girlfriend, Faye, who's 32, recently got a new job. She got her master's in 2020 and never stops talking about it. 
My husband, Jack, who's 36, has noticed the same thing, and he has said his brother Luke, who's 32, talks about it too. It gets on our nerves, but we tolerate it because we know how excited Faye is about her degree and now this new job, which she also won't stop talking about because, as she says, she wouldn't have gotten it if she didn't pursue her master's since it's a requirement. We had them over for dinner last night with my parents and my father-in-law and mother-in-law. Once again, Faye brings up her new job. It doesn't start for another couple of weeks. She works in education, so her contracts are based on the school calendar, and she was talking about all the things she gets to do now that she really wanted to do. She mentioned it being a life goal. I asked her what was next. She asked what I meant. I asked her about things like kids or marriage, since they've been together for three years now. She said she didn't want to rush into marriage or kids until she had her goals in order, but marriage was something she and Luke had been seriously discussing. I asked when she'd have time for kids or marriage with her career goals. She said she'd make time. I said kids are a lot of work. I'm a stay-at-home mom. I told her that when I was pregnant, it wasn't feasible financially or logically to continue working as a stay-at-home mom. So I quit at 26. Faye said that she doesn't want kids she can't provide for, and she likes relying on herself because so many stay-at-home moms are financially trapped when they stop working and can't leave if the marriage falls apart for whatever reason. I'll be honest, I was offended by that. I told her not all of us are trapped. She agreed but said you never know and you should depend on yourself, even in marriage. Luke was nodding and agreeing. I said, it would also give you more to talk about other than your job. Faye asked if I had a problem with her talking about her job. I said no, but honestly, it's the only thing she seems to have that's mildly interesting. Everyone else talks about kids, home life, vacations, family, hobbies, but all you talk about is your degree, education, and this new job of yours. And I told her it was kind of boring. Faye said, then I won't bore you any further, and asked my in-laws how installing wood floors was going. We all moved on past the conversation until later that night. After Luke and Faye left, my mother-in-law told me I was rude. I told her I was telling the truth because we are all tired of hearing about it. Jack agreed, but mother-in-law said that while that was true, it's still an accomplishment no one looked me up and down and this family has done yet and I seemed jealous. I said I wasn't jealous but offended by some things she said. Mother-in-law told me I was only offended because Faye was right. Jack said she was right but it was obvious she was directing those comments at me in a judgmental way and my parents agree with me. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. She's excited but that's not the main part. You're offended at her concerns about being a stay-at-home parent when you started it. I asked her what was next. She asked what I meant. I asked her about things like kids or marriage since they've been together for three years now. I asked when she'd have time for kids or marriage with her career goals. Seriously, you spent a conversation pursuing her on why her plans, note her plans, weren't good enough. This is on you. You're the jerk. Also, it's none of your business asking someone about their plans of having kids. Perhaps they tried and didn't get pregnant yet. Unless someone brings the topic up themselves, never just assume someone can and wants to. Thank you. I don't care if you're family or best friends since you were kids or strangers. It's none of your business what someone's future family plans are. OP is super judgy about it too. I used to be really vague like that too when judgy people would ask when I'm having kids because I didn't want to have the inevitable argument by telling them that I don't want to have kids. No matter what Faye's reasons and plans are, OP needs to mind her own beeswax. Edit. I'm not saying that you can't ask your friends and family about their plans for getting married or having kids. I'm saying that it can be a sensitive topic for a lot of people, and when someone gives you an answer, no matter what it is, you need to accept it. The fact that they've been together for three years and are not married might also be a sore spot for her. I think I'm sensitive to this discussion because my in-laws were awful to me never took any interest in my work, my volunteer activities, my family, my hobbies, my interests. Maybe they thought I was boring because I wasn't a stay-at-home mom with kids to talk about. That sounds snarky, but it isn't. I mean it genuinely. I've never considered your point of view before. Either way, you weren't very kind to her. Kindness costs you nothing. You're the jerk. You're the jerk for so many reasons. One, you never ask a woman when she's going to have kids. It might be a sensitive topic and it's none of your business. What if she doesn't want to have them at all? For some people, being a woman doesn't mean being a mom, and that's totally okay. 2. What she said about stay-at-home moms is true. You might not be trapped or feel that way, 
but it is undeniable that if you make your own money, you have a lesser chance to be trapped in a relationship. So I don't think you being offended by that statement is right. 3. She accomplished something that she feels proud of. Of course she's going to talk about it. I bet you talk about your kids because you're proud of them, just the same as she's proud of her education. Next time, maybe think through what you're going to say so you don't come across as a total jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for how she acted or not? Please let us know. When you meet a highly judgmental person in life, it's a good idea to avoid them like the plague. You can't work with us. Okay, I won't. I started this job in December of 2018. The team was small, seven of us, including me. Quickly after I started, it became clear that none of them liked me at all. The bullying started off subtly, ignoring me. I was aware of what they were doing, so after a little while of this, I began marrying their behavior. They didn't like that, and it escalated. I began to develop migraines from the stress. As much as I hadn't been bothered in the beginning, there's only so long you can go in an environment like that without some kind of effect. By this point, it had been several months. The migraines started to affect my attendance. Of course, they didn't like that either, and it continued to escalate. The manager knew all that was happening, but nothing changed. Well, anyway, I wanted another baby, so my husband and I decided to use the job for what it was worth, a nice nine-month-long paid maternity leave. So about one year after I started the job, I became pregnant. Then came my birthday. I was expecting nothing, of course, but I got a card and some chocolates from the girls, aka the only one with a conscience signed it from the girls because she didn't want me to get anything and no, they'd flat out refused. Put it down to pregnancy hormones, but when she gave it to me, I of course knew it was only from her and cried my little eyes out. This was a Thursday. The next day, I asked my manager to work alone. I covered all of the wards. I was a hospital phlebotomist by myself while they stayed in the clinic. When I was done, I helped out the nursing assistants in the clinic across to avoid them. Later, my manager came down to see me and discuss. Apparently, they had complained to her that I had not helped them at all, even though it was so busy that they'd have to get the NAs to help, which was a lie since I was with the NAs all day. They never had to go help. I explained to the manager what had happened and that I just needed some space as the alternative would have been to go home. I began crying again, pregnancy, and the inevitable stress of being ganged up on for over a year by five people every day just gets to you after a while. The manager told me to take the following week off, free of charge, i.e. she had not write me up. When I came back the following Monday, I wasn't okay, but I was better than I had been. I wondered what my reception would be and lo and behold, it was horrible. A whole confrontation went down where one of them had the audacity to ask me if I had considered their feelings when I told our manager I didn't want to work with them on that Friday. <sighs> I knew I had turned some kind of mental corner because I laughed in her face finally stood up for myself instead of just ignoring it, and then walked off to go do my job, and I didn't feel bad about it. This was in December 2019. At this point, I was about six weeks pregnant, and this is where my revenge began. I was pretty unwell through my pregnancy, and so heavily protected by UK laws and by the hospital's very own maternity policies, I wasn't making much of an effort to go to work when I didn't feel 100% okay doing so. Needless to say, I had quite the chunk of time off between December 2019 and early 2020. Fast forward to March 2020, and as you all know, lockdown was in full swing, and we were days away from a nationwide lockdown. Of course, ordinarily, this wouldn't affect me because I worked in a hospital, but this is where, finally, my malicious compliance comes in. It was a late March Monday morning, and I was in unusually high spirits on the way into my shift. My morning sickness was finally starting to abate, and there had been no drama for a little while, and I did actually really like my job when I was allowed to just do it. So I was in quite a good mood, and I even greeted my jerk colleagues cheerily. Well, I was greeted with a sharp, you're not coming in here. I was confused, unsure as to what I could have possibly done over the last four days that I hadn't even seen this woman. So after asking her what she meant, what she meant was she and our other colleagues didn't want to go on the wards so they had just stuck to the clinic and had planned to send me there instead. We're meant to do the wards first, and they start an hour before I did. Well, my manager and I had already agreed I'd not go on the wards due to lockdown and my pregnancy. I sensed danger and went to call my manager. I let her know what had transpired, and we agreed that I'd just find a spare room in the clinic and work in there, so I did. Not even 30 minutes later, and lo and behold, grumpy colleagues come storming over to me, 
demanding to know why I didn't share the whole story with her. I say, what story? There is no story. She says the agreement between our manager. I said, what business is it of hers? So she yells at me. Well, you can't work with us. I snap and tell her to sort her attitude out and walk off from her. Well, I've had enough. I go to see my manager to tell her so. And when I get there, after telling her what was said, I say, since this colleague likes to act like my supervisor so much, how about I finally take some direction from her? I won't work with her or any of them. I'm done. My manager not only agrees, but tells me to shield instead, preserving my pay, fully paid sick leave, and my pay time off, which took me up to the mat leave start dinner. Winner. Which took me up to my maternity leave start date. Winner. And the kicker? They were stuck short-staffed for a full year during lockdown because my job was legally protected until I officially left it, which was not until March of 2021. So I walked out mid-shift, left them high and dry, and in the words of my manager, they brought it on themselves. Edit. Also a note to the victim blamers who seem to be making their way in. It's fine if you don't believe I was being bullied or that it was somehow my fault. I know what happened and I know how I dealt with it day to day. I don't divulge a great deal of details on what they did to me, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. I did my best with the situation I was in and that's good enough for me. Please educate yourself on bullying. Just curious how you could be so unlikable by so many people. There's something missing here. OP. A question I must have asked myself every day for a long time until I realized bullying isn't about the victim, it's about the bully. There was nothing I could do because it wasn't something I was doing. And you know what? Even if I was doing something that caused me to be incredibly unlikable, it doesn't excuse bullying. So no, there's nothing missing except more details on how they bullied me. I don't know you or your colleagues, but in my experience, when someone says none of their colleagues likes them and claims the entire team is bullying them, more often than not, it's you that's the actual problem. They likely feel that they don't want anything to do with you as you likely make working with them bad. Take a look at how you work with others maybe. OP. It certainly crossed my mind and was a question I asked myself daily while working there. What am I doing wrong? This alongside various efforts to get along with them, improve situations, etc. Additionally, others did like me. We worked with loads of people regularly. It was just the core team that didn't like me and never had any issues like this in any other jobs I've had. Not to say I was perfect, I'm sure there are things I could have done better, things I've reflected on since, etc. But I know I did my best with the situation I was in, and I know it didn't warrant their behavior towards me. I've had to allow that to be good enough for me so that I could heal. Bullying like this happens, however unbelievable it sounds. Have you ever been bullied at work? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for kicking out my boyfriend's 19-year-old daughter? My boyfriend of three years moved into my home three weeks ago after his lease went up and he was unable to renew with the price hike they expected. His rent was $1,600 for a two-bedroom and upon signing a new lease, they said it would now be $2,400. I have a three-bedroom home and one son, who's 11. Both his room and my room have an attached bathroom. The guest room does not. We've lived here for five years and I bought it last year. My boyfriend has a 19-year-old daughter named Jess who visits him on the weekends and lives at home with her mother. Literally never had any issues with her up until my boyfriend moved in. When he moved in, Jess started becoming this little snob who had demand after demand that she fully expected me to meet. Like she wanted me to kick my son out of his room so she could have the room with an attached bathroom, stating that a boy didn't need a bathroom as much as a girl did. When I said absolutely not, she got extremely rude and condescending whenever she was in my home. She also tried parenting my son on more than one occasion, telling him what he can and cannot watch on the TV, what he can and cannot snack on, etc. There have been times when he's tried talking to us and Jess will butt in and say something about how kids are so annoying. If I speak up to her, she says, I don't believe I was talking to you or roll her eyes at me. Bold for someone who doesn't pay any rent or food costs to be staying in my home. I told her father last week that either he gets a handle on his adult kid or she was getting booted to the curb. He immediately starts telling me I need to give her time because this is an adjustment for her and that apparently she's having a hard time at her mom's house due to them arguing all the time. Gee, I wonder why. I told him that wasn't my problem and that at my house, me and my son were not going to be treated like this because she can't control her emotions and wants to take her resentment out on us. He said he would talk with her. His talk did nothing at all. 
In fact, she confronted me about it and said, I don't know what game you're playing here, but respect is earned, not given, and I will not be granting you respect until you prove to me you deserve it. She then walks to the living room where my son was watching TV and takes the remote from him and tells him to move. At this point, I go in and immediately tell her to get out of my house. She tells me she isn't going anywhere because her dad lives here, so I end up calling her uncle, who is a police officer, and have her escorted from my house after she collected all of her belongings. My boyfriend says I crossed a line, so I told him he can leave too. He currently isn't speaking to me, locked away in my bedroom. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Remove your boyfriend too. He's not on your mortgage or house deed. He's a guest there at your discretion. If he's going to act this way, he's shown you who he is. Get rid of him before he harasses you or your son. Not the jerk at all. Your boyfriend has been in your house less than 30 days. Tell him to get off your bed, pack his things, and get out now. Then make him your ex. The apple didn't fall too far from the tree. You know exactly where his entitled daughter got her attitude from. Am I the jerk for having my husband drive me back to shore when I wasn't allowed to fish? I, 32, female, rented a boat two weeks ago to go fishing. My husband suggested we celebrate his birthday at the same time, which is coming right up because he loves boating. I had no problem with it, but the whole rental was originally so I could fish. He invited our mutual friend, Greg, along, which was no big deal. But it soon turned into Greg driving everywhere and telling us to relax and have a few beers. He refused to sit in one spot for more than 10 to 15 minutes, so I wasn't able to fish at all. Every time I would have a line out for more than 5 minutes, he would ask if we were ready to move on to the next spot. At one point, even bringing us to a crowded sandbar beach where I obviously wasn't able to fish. Roughly 3 hours in, I asked if they could stop driving around so I could do some fishing, and he immediately stopped the boat, no questions asked. But it got really awkward after that. Greg making comments about how he wished he liked to fish so he could understand the hype of sitting in one single spot while on a boat because he can't stand it. Heavy sighing and pacing the boat, etc. I know for a fact he wasn't trying to be a jerk. He truly just couldn't stand sitting in one spot so that I could fish. So my husband at this point was getting uncomfortable with how awkward Greg was unintentionally making things and said, Well babe, are you about ready to move to the next spot? At this point, I just asked them to bring me back to shore. Both of them started protesting and apologizing, saying it was fine and we could stay there longer. But at this point, I was so over the entire trip because I didn't get to fish more than 25 minutes at this point. They bring me back to shore, still apologizing, and Greg saying he was sorry for ruining my fishing trip. And I just said it was fine and walked off to my car without saying another word to them. Well, after my husband got home, he was really quiet and when I asked him why, he said that it was a bummer that I chose to leave instead of just enjoying the boat for what it was. He said he understands my frustrations, but he couldn't understand why I took it to a level of ruining my entire day and leaving him on the boat that was meant for us. Greg paid me half of the cost I spent to make up for it too, so now I'm wondering if I'm really in the wrong considering the whole point of me getting the boat was to go fishing. Am I the jerk? ETA. Both Greg and my husband knew I rented the boat to fish. My husband even brought his fishing pole but didn't end up using it. Not the jerk. Inviting Greg defeated the entire purpose. Lesson learned, I hope. The boat wasn't for us, like he mentioned, because Greg was also there. I would understand if it were two couples, but a married couple plus husband's friend is just strange and awkward. Plus, he hijacked your fishing trip. He could have said, or asked, to just enjoy this weekend with him during his birthday and go fishing another time. It doesn't have to be awkward. My significant other and I have been together for 16 years. We've done camping trips, mini vacations, or day trips with one extra person many times. It's only awkward if you make it awkward. We make a point to be welcoming and chill. That being said, Greg took over the trip, which is rude since he was invited along and didn't take part in planning. If either OP or her hubby knew Greg was going to want to drive around the whole time, maybe he wouldn't have gotten an invite. Also, if I rented a boat, I'd be the only one driving. I wouldn't be risking anyone being dumb and costing me big bucks paying for damage. So if Greg just took over driving without asking, he's double the jerk. Not the jerk. You wanted to fish and rented a boat. You weren't able to fish. Letting Greg do the day the way he wanted to do was a mistake. He was your guest and should have behaved like one. Am I the jerk for completely cutting my wife off financially? I know the title sounds bad, but let me explain. 
My wife and I have been together for a total of eight years. We have a five-year-old daughter. When my wife was a kid, she grew up with a kid named Kelly who was pretty much a throwaway. My wife's family took Kelly in when she was nine. During the eight years of our relationship, Kelly constantly pops up for a while and then randomly disappears for months on end. About two months ago, Kelly resurfaced after her boyfriend was sent to prison on serious charges. Kelly also has a lengthy record. My wife gave me a super sob story trying to get me to agree to let Kelly come stay with us. I was firm on my decision, but my wife went ahead and let her occupy our guest bedroom anyways. I immediately placed our kid with my mother-in-law and told my wife she was not coming back home until Kelly was gone. Kelly stayed with us for 11 days until I had to kick her out. A week ago, I was looking at our bank statement for something totally unrelated. I noticed several Walmart charges for $100 to $300 each, all made the same day. I thought that was odd. I looked over our credit card statement and found a $570 charge for a local motel. Immediately I knew. I confronted my wife. She quickly admitted to the hotel and let me know that $570 was for the first two weeks. She would be getting billed for another two weeks shortly. On the Walmart charges, she acted shocked, quite clueless. She actually made the suggestion that perhaps Kelly was able to retrieve the card info from the motel and somehow used it at Walmart. However, the bank issued debit card and credit card are two entirely different entities not connected to each other. The total, including the two-week motel stay, came to $1,367. I then informed my wife I was canceling her cards, all of them, and filing a police report against Kelly since my wife had repeatedly said she didn't make those Walmart charges. Soon, my wife remembered everything. She bought Kelly clothes, shoes, food, toiletries. Then she withdrew cash several times because of Walmart's limit. She had to make small purchases and ask for cash back. Luckily, the credit card was canceled before the next motel charge hit. My wife was okay about me canceling all her cards until she learned she wasn't getting them back. I made it clear. It's not about her spending the money. She's a stay-at-home mom, and I do believe it's her money too. But she lied to me. Aside from that, she's also enabling Kelly. And she never bothered to discuss this with me. She's now accusing me of being financially controlling, since now basically she can't go anywhere unless I'm there to pay. Her mom told her to get a job and get a private bank account that I won't have access to if I want to play this game. I started thinking that I might be the jerk because I'm realizing my wife feels that I'm punishing her it might not seem that way, but it's not my intentions. Not the jerk. Her mom is right. If she wants to blow money that she didn't earn while not consulting you, she can get a job. You have a five-year-old and a $1,000 motel bill on a single salary household is tough. Your wife needs to get her priorities straight before she messes up and loses her family. Absolutely not the jerk. However, I completely disagree with your she can get a job comment. She has a job. She's a stay-at-home mom. The problem is that she didn't discuss anything with OP about their shared finances before she unilaterally gave her friend $1,367. If everything in this story was exactly the same, except that it was OP who gave his friend over $1,000 without informing his wife, he would absolutely be the jerk for the exact same reason, even though he was the one that earned the money. She can get a job? So being a stay-at-home mom isn't a job now? It is, but it's not one with an income. Stay-at-home parents should charge what daycares do then. Not the jerk. Your reasons are valid. Your wife has proven that she cannot be trusted with unlimited access to the family's finances. She has also proven that she cares more about enabling Kelly than she does her own kid. At this point, I would tell her that her options are immediate marriage counseling, immediate individual counseling, cutting Kelly out of her life completely and getting a job to repay what she basically stole from the family, or you can file for divorce and pursue majority custody based on her favoring Kelly over your kid. Everyone sucks here. Cutting your spouse off from all financial resources isn't okay, especially if she's staying with your kid every day. Emergencies happen and you can't always be available to pay for things. You two need to discuss the situation and get on the same page. She shouldn't be paying for her friend's living accommodations without telling you, but you're punishing her for that rather than trying to find a solution. Everyone sucks here. I get your predicament and it totally sucks, but have you discussed setting up a secondary account for her? Like a portion of your earnings could go into a spending account that you're comfortable with her lighting on fire if she wants and it won't cause any financial stress. I think there's obviously some unresolved issues with Kelly and your wife that need to be addressed, but that's on her and them to figure out. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. If Reddit boy did something like this, 
you'd need a new head. Am I the jerk for kicking out my mother and sister? I'm 21, female. I own my own place. I've lived here for a while now, and I loved my own peace living by myself with no kids or a spouse. My mom, who's 41, wasn't the best when I was growing up. She would bring guys in and out of the home all the time. I'm glad nothing ever happened to me, but it gave me a bad view for her once I grew up and not a good relationship along with it. I have a sister, 22, who's disabled physically and mentally. I grew up with her, but it was extremely hard to form a relationship with her. I had to take care of her a lot growing up because my own mom wouldn't do any of it due to mom wilding around. My sister and I shared a room growing up and I hated every second of it, if I'm going to be honest. My mom has been renting for a place to live and since a few months ago, she can't live there anymore. My sister still lives with my mom and my mom doesn't take care of her actively. She pays for a caregiver. My mom guilt tripped me into letting her and my sister live with me temporarily for a month. I eventually said yes. It was fine for the first few days. My mom and sister have been living here now for three months. My mom said only one month. I have to work a lot, so I'm barely there anyways. But when I have a day off, I hate every second of it. I know my sister cannot help it, that she makes noises, a lot of noises, loud noises. It's like I can hear it everywhere. The caregiver still cares for her, but it's like having a complete stranger in my home. Long story short, on my day off, after hearing everything and the noises and tantrums, I went insane and snapped. I told my mom she has to leave. She refused to leave at first, but eventually she did. The last thing she told me was, You're supposed to be grateful that I gave you a home to live in, and you can't give that back? You're a jerk and always have been. I eventually told her to just leave, and my mom got my sister and they both left. I feel like I'm the complete jerk because of the fact that I told her to leave just because I was tired of my sister, even though she cannot help it at all. Am I the jerk? Edit. Thank you all for taking the time to comment. I have no new news about my mom or sister. I haven't spoken to her since she left. I haven't been able to reply to comments because I've been insanely busy today, but I just now read most of the comments. I appreciate it and I started crying at some comments because they hit a soft spot for me. I appreciate the comments you guys left. Thank you. Am I the jerk for refusing to stand up for my girlfriend when I felt she purposely started drama with my mother? I've been with my girlfriend for two years and we're talking about getting engaged soon. I love her wholeheartedly and would choose her over my mom in a heartbeat. They don't get along at all, so it's come up plenty of times and I think I've done a good job of siding with my girlfriend. They just flat out don't like each other, but they also seem to have some rivalry going on. My girlfriend has confided in me that she feels like she can't win. They're both guilty of being competitive, but she feels my mom has a lot of stuff over her. I of course don't agree, but it bothers her. My mom is really good at cooking, but her baking is just okay. She can't decorate the cakes at all, and my girlfriend recently discovered this. My mom's fiance had a birthday and he wanted a banana cake with honey cream cheese frosting. My mom made it and it wasn't great looking. Tasted good though. My girlfriend made the same cake but decorated it beautifully and decided to bring it to the party. It was a work of art but I told her she was just trying to cause problems and I didn't want her to bring it. She decided to bring it and I didn't stop her. When we got there, my mom saw her cake and didn't look happy but she didn't say anything. My mom's fiancé just flat out refused to touch my girlfriend's cake. I think he told other guests to do the same because no one would eat it. I took a big piece and I praised it, but she was clearly upset. She went over and tried to pressure him to eat it and honestly, he was pretty rude. He told her he sees through her. He isn't going to touch her cake, but if it makes her feel better because she found one thing that she's good at, then take the win. He thanked my mom for his cake kissed her, and then told my girlfriend she was bothering him and to get out of his face. I didn't do anything in the moment. She later asked me to talk to him and I declined. I said she brought the cake to cause problems, so I think his reaction was okay. She teared up a bit and said that he was really mean and I need to say something. I still refused, and when we left, I said goodbye, thanked them for inviting us, and was just normal. She accused me of being spineless and is still upset. Not the jerk. Your girlfriend was way out of line, and I don't care how rude mom's fiancé was to her. He was just exactly perfect in what he did for his love. Your girlfriend does not deserve a win for trying to one-up your mom at her fiancé's birthday. She's gross, and I have some ideas about why your mom doesn't like her. Yeah, I mean, the girlfriend is a massive rude jerk here, 
This is outrageous. Trying to upstage the birthday boy's fiance, the hostess, by bringing in a fancier version of the cake and even trying to pressure people into eating it and then acting like she's got any right to feel hurt because people were mean, as in they called her out for how outrageous she was being, instead of embarrassed and mortified because what on earth was she thinking? Not the jerk OP, but your girlfriend is not right in the head. This goes beyond just being competitive. She was being mind-bogglingly rude and out of line and it's a giant marinara flag that she doesn't acknowledge just how bad she messed up and how rude she was. It's unhealthy for her to be so obsessed with winning. She's willing to cause scenes and ruin celebrations with this type of intentional being a jerk and won't even apologize but will instead get mad at people for not supporting her insane upstaging antics. Edit. The fiancé probably didn't even need to ask the other guests not to eat your girlfriend's cake because anyone with any understanding of basic manners and decency would not want to offend the host by going along with such a rude stunt. Seriously, OP, you need to think if you're willing to lose your mom over your girlfriend because she seems determined to destroy any relationship or goodwill between them. This is a ridiculous level of being a jerk. Kudos to your mom and her fiancé for handling it so well. Not the jerk. Reddit loves to crap on mother and father-in-laws and difficult parents in general, but maybe it's time to have a long, hard look at if your mother's reasons for not liking your girlfriend are valid. If this was your birthday, maybe I'd understand a little more, but your girlfriend tried to show up your mother at her fiancé's birthday and he handled it like a pro. I wouldn't put it past your girlfriend to turn up to your mother's wedding wearing white. This feud isn't going to go away, so before you propose, have a think about if you're really willing to lose your mother over your girlfriend because after her little stunt, I wouldn't be surprised if they choose to go low or no contact. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Reddit is actually siding with the mother-in-law? I don't think this has ever happened before. Is this a glitch in the matrix? Am I the jerk for asking my team member where she was when I noticed her away status while she was work from home? My team at work does four days work from the office and one day work from home. This is because we have sensitive physical paper files to work with as part of our work, so we still have to come into the office. One of my team members, Sarah, had appealed to do two days work from the office and three days work from home instead, on the basis that she has two kids to look after. Although other team members also have kids and Sarah had no problem coming in five days a week before lockdown, I relented to the request after she became upset and accused me of being inflexible and started crying in my office and also checking with the rest of my team to make sure they were okay with it. I've noticed of late that when Sarah is work from home, she has a tendency to go offline or away on Skype during office hours. She's usually offline or away for more than an hour each time. Yesterday I finally asked her about it and told her that other people, internal clients and external stakeholders have come to me for work matters she's handling because they could not locate her. One external stakeholder even told me that Sarah was on leave. When I clarified that Sarah was not on leave, the stakeholder was bewildered. But she's been offline the whole morning. Sarah was defensive and sarcastically apologized for not being there to reply to messages immediately. She then added that as long as she got her work done, it didn't matter when she was online or offline. I told her she didn't have to be online for the entire 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. duration, but minimally from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m with a break for lunch, so that A, people can reach her if they need to, and B, other team members don't notice and start following her example, particularly since Sarah is senior to the others. Sarah was unhappy, and since then I've come to be aware that she's been saying things about me to the rest of the team, including how I am a dinosaur still working according to former working norms. So am I the jerk? Edit. The entire division, including Sarah, reports to me. Sarah is salaried, not hourly. Sarah's work is affected by her behavior because part of her job is being available to internal clients and where applicable, external stakeholders. External stakeholders can see whether Sarah is online or offline because we are all linked in a single public Skype network comprising related agencies, organizations, companies, and ministries. Separately, Sarah's conduct affects me and other team members since we have to respond to queries meant for Sarah, particularly when they are urgent. It also reflects badly on the division as a whole when Sarah is unreachable. Not the jerk. Employees are evaluated on more than work product. There's teamwork, reliability, engagement, etc. Further, business hours do not change because you work from home. 
Sarah's lack of accessible denotes her failure at teamwork and engagement. People that think like she does are going to be sorely disappointed, outright upset, when they do not get a bonus or promotion or lateral move to a different position. If your coworkers and clients cannot access you during business hours, you're failing at your position. One question to consider, how much of the I need to speak to this person now is actually necessary? This description of immediate responses being needed from both internal and external stakeholders reminds me a lot of a previous company I worked for. They had built up a culture of always being available to reply, but it really wasn't necessary. It often put us behind because we were always working on immediate fires. It was distracting. Every time I needed to work on something that took any kind of creative brain power, I'd be interrupted by just a quick question or can't find this file, can you resend? There are certain roles where being available for communication at all times is important, customer service, administrative assistance, but in most other roles, it's simply not. I'd love to see more managers reevaluating this need to be constantly connected. 100% We have started to leave ours on invisible so clients do not know if we are online and get back to them within a business day and not one has complained. But if they see someone online and they don't reply, their manager often gets a follow-up from the client or coworker trying to contact them. I'm much more productive when I can work on a file without interruption and schedule time to check and reply to messages and within my team, we use a second chat platform for immediate requests and questions. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is Sarah? Please let us know. Don't worry, Sarah will get back to you as soon as she finishes the episode she's watching. Want me to scrub the registers at peak time? All right then, sure thing, boss. I work in the store where you pay for a cart and the cashiers all sit. The store floors frequently get pretty dirty because, well, there's a lot of customers coming in and out, especially at the time this story happens. I'm doing some backstock when the manager on duty comes up to me and says, hey, store manager wants you to scrub produce and the register area. Keep in mind, our scrubber is a behemoth, loud and can be difficult to maneuver. Not the best equipment to pull out at 5 p.m. on a Monday. Also, there are lines 8 to 10 people deep at both open registers. I point this out to the manager on duty and she just shrugs, saying, Just get it done. Okay then. I pull out the scrubber and happen to get a lucky break. Produce is empty, so it only takes me a couple of minutes. Now the registers, still crowded. I take the scrubber around the empty registers, feeling the glare of customers on my back. Whether it was from the noise or the weight, I don't know, and nor do I care. Now I'm left with the two jam-packed registers. There's no way I could ask people to wait a moment to let me through. They're already upset. I can see the manager coming, gesturing at me to get it done. So I do the most efficient thing I can think of. I go to the back of the line, shut down the scrubber and wait. And wait. And wait. Customers are lining up behind me, and the cashiers are holding back a laugh as I creep closer. Finally, I'm next, and I run the scrubber through the registers. Thankfully, the line at the second register cleared just as I was finishing the first. All done. I take the scrubber back to the break room, and I had just started to empty it when the store manager comes storming in. Store manager. Why did that take you so long? Scrubbing is supposed to go quickly. We're too busy for you to be standing around. Me. He wanted me to scrub the registers, but the registers were packed. I told manager on duty that it would take a while. You weren't scrubbing. You were just standing in line. Me. Yep, that was the best way to get through the line. The store manager and I have a stare down for a few seconds before she throws her hands up and walks away. And I've never been asked to scrub the registers during peak times again. My friend's cousin complied with his cool family's demands. This happened a while back, maybe three to four years ago. My college friend told me about how his cousin basically did over his family by moving out when they told him to. Note. To make it easier to follow, I'm going to use fake names. Cousin is Jack, cousin's sister is Tina, cousin's parents, Bob and Mary. So Jack is roughly 28 and still living with his parents, but he pays their bills. Electric, water, internet, etc. And this is a big two-story house, so the bills are big too. His sister, who's 24, had left the house by then and gotten married to a guy that makes good money. She had taken credit for paying the bills and convinced Bob and Mary to kick him out because he's a shut-in loser because none of them understood his job. A bit of backstory on their parents. My friend tells me they're like those stereotypical teens in the cliché high school movies. Basically, they look down on nerds and think people who study hard are uncool, that type of thing. 
Anyway, they kept that mentality even after growing up and having kids. So they always looked down on Jack for being nerdy and favoritized Tina because she was pretty and popular in high school. But apparently, Jack didn't really care because his personal life had friends he cared about and he connected more with his relatives. So they all confront him and after badmouthing him about how he stays in his room mostly and how his sister, her husband and kid need the space, told him he has till the end of the month to leave. This was done close to the first week. Jack didn't say a word. He just nodded and left by the end of that week and moved three cities away to a city closer to his other relatives. Two months go by and his sister calls him, asking why this month's bills weren't paid as their lights and water had been shut off. He tells her that she should have paid them since she was allegedly paying them before. About a week goes by and he gets a call from his parents explaining how his sister confessed to everything and how he can come back and have his old room back so long as he kept helping them pay the bills. He refused, saying he's enjoying living by himself and how he can focus on his work more because he's away from them. Afterwards, he blocked their numbers and now they have to pay for it themselves. He doesn't know what happened after that because they're no longer invited to family gatherings. I'm the delivery guy, not a porch pirate. This just happened and I had to post it. My husband and I both work for Amazon Flex, which has freelance drivers deliver packages to different areas that are a little off the beaten path. This way, everyone, even those who live in tiny forgotten towns that are surrounded by cornfields, will get their packages in a timely manner. Today, my husband, who I'll refer to as husband, was doing a block in such an area. It's early in the day and the car is full of packages when he entered small town. It was the kind of place that had a post office, a gas station, an old mill, and a sheriff. It's the place where everyone knows everyone because they're all related by blood or marriage. So when husband starts making stops at houses in town in an unfamiliar car, everyone noticed. Husband doesn't even realize that he's being watched. It's just another stop on his delivery route. Then he goes to drop off a package at a house at the end of a dead end road. He does the drop at the door, sends the notice to the customer that the package has arrived and gets back in the car to go to the next stop. Except the road is now being blocked by a sheriff's car. Husband stops and sheriff approaches him telling him that he had received some calls about him, a suspicious man that was going from house to house and had packages in his vehicle. Husband gives him his ID and tells him, I work for Amazon. I just delivered a package to that house back there. These other packages are for other customers. Sheriff takes a look at husband's ID, then his phone to take a look at the app. Then Sheriff looks at his own phone before going to the house husband just left to see if the package was there. Sheriff then looks past husband and sees someone watching them. Husband described the look Sheriff gave the person as a mix of, of course, and are you messing with me? Sheriff then tells husband that he had been accused of being a porch pirate before stomping past husband to scream at the person watching them. Sheriff apparently not only knew the person who called to report husband as a porch pirate, but the delivery husband had just done was to the sheriff at his house. Sheriff went off on the nosy neighbor about, don't they have anything better to do, wasting police time, and how, yes, he was sure that husband was telling the truth since he had received the delivery notice on his phone and the package was on his porch. Sheriff came back to husband, thanked him for his time, and sent him on his way. Husband was annoyed that he was held up for over 20 minutes, but I think this story was worth it. Cue the malicious compliance. I was reminded of this earlier today when waiting to pay for some shopping. I'll mention this happened in the UK as we do like to cue and have a strong sense of fair play. I was in a budget supermarket, well known for its insane checkout speeds. Those who shop there regularly know that when there are more than two people waiting at each till, another till will be opened. I had just arrived at the checkout area and noted the queue lengths, so joined the back of the nearest queue with my basket. As expected, they announced a new till was opening and I began to make my way there. I reached it at the same time as a chap from the opposite end of the store who spotted I had far fewer items than he and graciously beckoned me ahead. As I thanked him, a rather entitled woman precariously carrying lots of items came storming up behind us both, pushed past him and physically elbowed me out of the way, slamming her items on the belt in front of me. Barking that she was in a hurry, she glared at the cashier who had just arrived and still had to log on to the till, telling him to be quick. The cashier, the chap behind me, and I exchanged glances but decided not to make a fuss. Clearly, the cashier wasn't moving fast enough for her, 
so she started fishing around in her purse to get her payment ready. Unfortunately, it was a case of too much haste and she ended up with coins falling through her fingers and rolling around the floor. This, she felt, was the cashier's fault for not pushing the items along fast enough and wasted few words in telling him so. But what she didn't notice while doing so is that one of the pound coins rolled quite close to me. I saw it and the chat behind saw it, but neither of us felt the urge to mention it. In fact, I now had a decision to make. I did not want to help her by telling her, but keeping the coin would be stealing. Then it occurred to me what to do. I moved my foot in front so the coin was now completely hidden from her sight. I waited a couple of minutes like this and watched her pay and put her purse away. The chap behind me caught my eye and frowned, but I smiled innocently. The woman began to pick up her items, juggling them in her arms and made to leave. At the perfect moment, I called her attention and pointed out the coin, pushing it towards her with my foot. Watching her bending down at my feet, dropping the same items repeatedly whilst trying to pick up the coin made up for all of her rudeness. Her hair even fell out of her bun all over her face. The cashier was so cheered up, he wished her a great day and the man behind me laughed all the way through. The best part was that although he knew exactly what I'd done, we just smiled at each other and left it at that. Told to come to Drill Weekend with Pink Eye? If you say so. National Guard. I got Pink Eye once the day before Drill Weekend. Called my sergeant and was told I still had to come to first formation. I told him that's a bad idea because it's very contagious and I could spread it to the whole company and that I'd be happy to make up for Drill when it clears up. He says, I don't care. You're not a doctor. It's probably nothing. You better be here in the morning. I even offered to send a photo of my eye. No dice. I drive an hour to my unit Saturday morning and no one with any authority will see me because they're too busy or they're not there yet. Then about five minutes before first formation, I find the company first sergeant and ask him if I can see a medic about my pink eye. He looks at me, looks closer, and then blows up. Why are you here if you have pink eye? You could give that crap to everyone here. Why didn't you call in sick? I tried first sergeant. I called yesterday and sergeant moron said I'm not a doctor and I better be here in the morning. So I'm here. Darn it. He then flags down a different sergeant tells him to take me upstairs to our little in-house medical office and get checked out. Then he left to go chew Sergeant Moron a new one, but not before turning back and yelling, and don't touch anything. So here we go. Doctor immediately says, yup, you've got pink eye. These are the drops you need to buy. You're dismissed from this drill. Head to CVS, get these drops and go home. Get with your leadership and you can make up this weekend when your eye clears up. Note, this was just an armory, so we didn't stock any actual medical supplies beyond band-aids and ibuprofen. Yes, sir. So I leave, get the drops, and drive an hour all the way back home. It was just such a waste of time and gas. Found out Monday that by Sunday afternoon, three other specialists had pink eye symptoms and left early, and Sergeant Moron got an official dressing down by the company commander for this mess up. All of it could have been avoided. His excuse? I thought the fire drake was lying. Uh, never missed a drill in six years, but sure, I'm gonna start now. I did make up the drill weekend two weeks later over a Tuesday and Wednesday, and Sergeant Moron wouldn't even look at me, let alone apologize. Just gave me a list of simple chores to work on and left me to it for two days. Some people shouldn't be in a leadership position. Am I the jerk for secretly going to the dentist? Background information. I live in my boyfriend's country. I speak the language at an advanced level, but not fluent, especially with medical terms. So I have severe anxiety and dental phobia. I haven't been to the dentist in years and my boyfriend was hinting I should go. We agreed I would get anti-anxiety pills first and then go. He was going on a business trip and I wanted to get my anxiety meds, but there wasn't enough time before, so I did it when he was abroad. Then I went to a dental clinic. Everything went well and I told him about my appointment afterwards. I expected a happy and proud reaction that I did something I was scared of, but instead he was livid. He said I deceived him and did this behind his back. You did what I can't stand, and you did it alone to avoid the situation with me, while deceiving me, and I think you are a true coward who avoids scary situations. Honestly, it is true I was scared of his reaction if I have cavities. I thought it would blame me more than the dentist. So he is angry because I didn't tell him about the appointment or bring him with me. And he also thinks I'm getting scammed 
because they told me I need to come back in for a deep cleaning since it's been so long. Yet, when he goes to a clinic, he doesn't ask permission or let me know beforehand. Plus, just last week at the airport, he forced me to do something alone because I have to be independent. And the week before, he didn't go with me to my haircut for the same reason. It seemed like mixed signals to me. He ruined the good mood I had after overcoming a fear of mine, and it also feels very, very controlling. What should I do? Edit. He has gone to the dentist alone before and only told me after the fact, multiple times. Edit. His explanation for deception is this. 1. We made a rough plan to go to the dentist soon, together. 2. I told him I need my anti-anxiety meds before the dentist. Before he left, I said I want to refill them, but didn't explain I had booked a dentist appointment, because honestly I wasn't even sure I could go through with it. So I didn't explain to him why I wanted the meds, I just said I wanted to finish something on my to-do list, which was also true. Then when he was gone, I got my meds and went to the dentist myself, because originally I preferred that. So he says I wasn't transparent since I planned everything and only told him after. Not the jerk. And girl, there is so much marinara here. Dump this jerk ASAP. OP. We've been dating for seven years. I don't know if this is enough to break up over, but I don't feel good. It's enough if you feel it's enough. Many controlling people don't start out that way. And then they start gaslighting you until you get to the point of questioning whether the things they are doing are really that bad. Soon you make excuses for them like, they are only angry because they love me, and they're just worried about me, so they don't want me to do, insert anything normal people do. From the little background info you've given me, this does not sound like a one-time thing. As mentioned above, you are surrounded by marinara. Not the jerk. The only person scamming you here is your boyfriend. You went to the dentist, and he makes it all about him. Dump him like the cavity that he is. Well, how much marinara do you think boyfriend is showing? Please let us know. This boy's got more marinara than Papa John's. Did I do that right? I'm kind of new to this whole marinara thing. Am I the jerk for ordering for my sister's boyfriend while ordering all of the family-style plates at a restaurant? Last night, my parents asked to go out to dinner and offered to pay for everyone at a restaurant they wanted to share. They invited me, my husband, my sister, and her boyfriend. I'll call him Dave. My sister also invited a friend from work. This restaurant encourages family style, and that is what my parents wanted to pay for. Dave told the table that he would need a separate plate of noodles, pad thai, in addition to his share of the family style plates. I started helping my mom build a list of dishes to order, and we asked everyone what they would like. Then I went over the list with everyone and asked if everyone was happy. My dad is nearly deaf, my mom can be shy, and my sister isn't very interested, so I would typically be the one to order in these scenarios but I am never making decisions for other people, just collecting the list and ordering it. When the waitress came back, I told her the list of shared items, about eight total, and also ordered the pad thai for Dave and clarified that it would be for him, not shared. She then asked him if he wanted to add a protein. Dave got super upset and started saying things like, wow, I really did not like that. Wow, this has never happened before. I have never had someone order for me. Wow, I really hated that. I'm going to have to process what just happened. Wow, I don't think I like that at all. What? I was kind of stunned. He was at the other end of the table and I didn't mean to upset him. I thought I was being nice by making sure his separate dish was ordered and I didn't feel like I should be called out repeatedly in front of everyone. To be honest, I've been frustrated with Dave lately because he's living with my parents and my sister and he doesn't contribute financially. I thought it was a bit rude for him to insist that my parents buy an extra plate at a family-style dinner they were paying for, so adding on his very public outburst over me ordering for him has made me upset. I talked to my sister about how Dave's behavior last night made me frustrated, and she said I was being overly sensitive and that it was rude for me to order Dave's dish. Am I the jerk for ordering Dave's dish at the restaurant while I ordered for the table? Not the jerk. I think it's helpful when there are so many people to have one person do the ordering for the table. Next time say, the gentleman over there would like to order something on a separate check. Not the jerk, Dave's a weirdo. Not the jerk, table captain, carry on. It sounds like it was a large group of people and if it was a family style seating, I'd imagine the table was a little larger than normal. Pointing out to the waiter where the dish was to go is helpful. It ensures that the food gets placed with the person that will eat it. Otherwise, it's going to end up in your space, and then there's a juggle to get it to Dave. Serving is a dance, and you helped out. Well, who do you think is the jerk? 
OP or Dave? Please let us know. Why does there always have to be a Dave? Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit my step-siblings? I, 16 male, live mostly with my mom and see my dad every other weekend, per my choice. My dad is married to Shayna and she has three kids who are under the age of eight. Shayna was recently diagnosed with cancer and they started calling on me to babysit so she could rest or babysit so she could go get treatment and stuff. I said no. I don't want to be stuck babysitting her kids all the time and I don't really want to be part of their family. I was never super close to my dad and I'm not close to Shayna or her kids either and I don't really want to be. My dad's family don't accept his stepkids so they won't help out and Shayna has no family in the US anymore so they've been pretty upset at me for not wanting to help them out. When I am with them for my dad's weekends, which I need to go to, the judge said in court, mom needs to make sure I keep some relationship with my dad while I'm a minor and even threatened to fine her because I asked if she'd be in trouble if I stopped seeing my dad. They will often get me to watch the kids or it will be a big deal that I don't help them more. They also complain that I make it so obvious that I don't want to be with them. Shayna had a bad reaction to her treatment during the week and I was asked to babysit Saturday so she could rest and maybe go to the ER if she got worse. When I didn't go, my dad blew up my phone saying I was being a jerk and how dare I treat one of my parents the way I'm treating Shayna. I told him he was hardly a parent to me so he could buzz right off with saying Shayna is one of my parents. He said babysitting would be no big deal and would be a great chance for me and the kids to bond that refusing to is abandoning them when they could use an older brother. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk, and here's why. You don't like the whole family, and you don't need to. These are not your kids or your siblings. You have no bond with them. They should pay a babysitter. You are their stepson, not a free babysitter, but it would be nice if you helped out once or twice, but not constantly. One wonders why the dad can't look after the kids to give his wife a rest. Edit. Child care is the dad's responsibility, but he shouts at his kid for not doing it. This comment is not smug, nor does it insult the dad for no reason. It indicates mild skepticism based on the fact that the father is acting like a total jerk towards his kid. A father that is such a great father that his kid would prefer not to see him. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you babysit your step-siblings or not? Please let us know. If I dislike them that much, no, I'm not doing anything for them. They can get over it. Karen demands my college fund. I, 19 female, have an aunt, Amy, who's 38, who I love and she loves me dearly. It's never been explicitly stated, but between my sister, Kim, who's 17, and myself, I'm the favorite niece. I didn't really notice until I was around my early teens, but whenever I had an event, my aunt would always try to be there while she was never there for anything my sister did. I got nicer presents and there are pictures of me in her house and she texts and calls me regularly. She barely acknowledges my sister and I never knew why. One of the reasons why it took so long for me to notice was because whenever someone would mention something about the different treatment, our mom would just brush it off and since Amy was my paternal aunt, I just accepted it. Fast forward to now and my mom sent me down and asked me if I would be willing to go to a less expensive school so I could have extra money to share with Kim. Aunt Amy set up a fund for me and my two cousins, but didn't have a dime for Kim. She did this with Kim looking at me for an answer and got upset that I didn't give a definite yes. She accused me of not caring about her, just like Aunt Amy, and is refusing to speak to me until I give her half of the money. I thought that this was wildly unfair and asked my parents why they didn't have their own fund for Kim since Aunt Amy was taking care of me. They said that they did, but it wasn't as much as what Aunt Amy had for me. She's a smart woman who makes a lot of money and admitted that they had to dip into it to help pay for things when my dad wasn't working because of lockdown. I feel bad for Kim, but I don't want to sacrifice my future college experience for it. Am I really being so maliciously selfish? Entitled aunt thinks family means free dog sitter at her demand. So my aunt is always going camping with her son or hiking trips with her boyfriend about every other weekend and she never takes her dog with her. The current excuse is she doesn't think he'll get along with her boyfriend's dog. She never takes him anywhere, always has me and my parents' dog sit for her. It wouldn't be a problem if he wasn't a dog from heck. He pees on everything, he's super territorial, he bites people for being too close, terrorizes my cats to the point that they're terrified of coming downstairs when he's here. When we dog sit, she rarely picks him up when she's supposed to. 
She's always super late to everything. She'll say that she'll be here at 9 p.m. and instead it's close to midnight when she shows up. Or she won't show up until the next day because she or her son were too tired to swing by on their way home to get the dog. There have been several instances where she'll ask my dad if he can watch the dog and even without him actually agreeing to it, she'll show up in our backyard with her dog for us to watch. She has a history of having Facebook tantrums about how she has to cancel her plans during the times we say no and how it's so unfair to her. Well, my parents are going on a two-week vacation at the start of August. I'm staying home to take care of the house and our pets and have plans to go to my grandma's, who lives one and a half hours away, to do a joint birthday celebration with hers since our birthdays are that first week of the month. My aunt heard about my parents' plan of vacation last month and decided around the 4th that she's going on a vacation to the Grand Canyon with her son, her boyfriend, and his son for those same two weeks my parents will be having theirs. The woman had the actual gall to ask my folks to reschedule their vacation so that they'd be home to babysit her dog for two weeks. My parents flat out refused because why should they have to reschedule their vacation for her? She refused to accept their refusal and while we were all hanging out at my grandma's backyard, she just kept trying to persuade us. My aunt, we, her and her son, never get to take a vacation together out of state. I don't want to have to cancel. Dad, you don't have to cancel. You'll have to find someone or some place to watch your dog since wife and I won't be here or just take him with you. And, well, he's not good with these kinds of trips. Mom, have you ever actually taken him on a trip? You don't know how well he handles these if you've never taken him. And, well, he probably won't get along with boyfriend's dog and he gets so mean around people. OP, you're not going, so you can watch him, can't you? You don't have anything else to do. Me, no, I have plans during that time, and watching him on my own is exhausting. He bit me three times the last time he was here, and I have to watch him like a hawk to make sure he doesn't attack my cats. Well, the cats just hide upstairs when he's around, so they'll be fine. Me, and you think it's fair for our cats to have to hide upstairs for two whole weeks? One of them gets so freaked out by him just being there that she barely eats when he's around. Three days is hard enough on her. Two weeks is cruel. Well, you could figure something out. I really don't want to have to take him to the kennels for two weeks. I don't think it's humane to keep a dog in a kennel. Are you sure you two can't just push your vacation back a few weeks? It's just a lot of no's and eventually the conversation dropped and we thought that everything was fine. But then my aunt went on her usual Facebook rants because she probably felt no one in the family would see. Only my mom, my sister, our uncle, different aunt's husband, and his son are ever really on Facebook besides her. Going on a woe is me, the world is unfair complaint about how we are mean and that family is supposed to help each other out. So why can't we just stop being selfish and watch her dog? And if she doesn't have anyone to watch her dog, then she and her son will have to cancel plans and won't be able to go with her boyfriend and his son to the Grand Canyon and how unfair this was to them. She's also been pestering us constantly since then, the Facebook post, to see if we're suddenly available to take her dog for her. I'm honestly not going to be surprised if she just shows up in the backyard again to drop him off regardless of being told no. Edit. I see people bringing up pretty valid concerns of him really hurting someone but I don't think he's physically capable of that. He can be a pretty mean jerk, but he's also like 10 pounds and an ankle biter who's missing half his teeth. He can bite and it'll sting, but it's fairly easy to throw him off with how little and light he is. Though I don't encourage throwing animals, if he attacks someone, it wouldn't be that hard to do. Though I do think he'd be very capable of hurting other small animals, but I ain't an expert in this field, so I might be wrong. Tell her this. Tell her... I know you asked if I could keep the dog and I said no. I meant it. Just in case you forget and accidentally drop your dog off, I'm reminding you now that I am unavailable. If your dog gets dropped off, he will be taken to a kennel. If they refuse him for any reason, he will be taken to a shelter. I am unavailable. If you put me in this situation, I will assume you no longer care about the dog and have abandoned him. Speaking of dogs, what's your favorite dog in the world? Please let us know. Rottweilers for the win. Reddit boy had one when he was little and he misses her so much. Am I the jerk for pressing charges against my girlfriend's friend for stealing my doll? I, 26 male, 
have been with my still girlfriend, 26 female, for almost 4 years. Last year I gave her a key to my house. She spends a few days there, but we don't live together full time. A few days ago I had to make a quick trip for work. She asked me if she could invite a few of her friends to the house for a girls night. It was on Thursday. I accepted. I returned yesterday in the morning. The first thing I noticed was that the rag doll was missing from the wall. My first instinct was to call my girlfriend to ask if she had put it somewhere else. She denied it and said the doll was there. It wasn't. I checked the GPS of the doll. Yes, it has a GPS. The GPS marked the house of one of her friends. Let's call her Jess. I tried to be nice and told my girlfriend to tell her friend to bring it back before 5 p.m. and I'll pretend this never happened or I'll involve the police. She tried to fight it, but I told her about the GPS. Well, my girlfriend called me back, saying that Jess denied having the doll. We had a huge argument, and I warned her that I wasn't playing about getting the police involved. I waited until 5 and went to the police. We went to her house and got the doll back. I pressed charges. My girlfriend and I had a bigger argument about me pressing charges. They, including her, knew that the doll was made by my father. They could have stolen anything else and I wouldn't bat an eye. I gave her friend a chance and she tried to play stupid. They've been calling me a jerk and to drop the charges. Edit. I will answer some of your questions here. If you have more, I will try to answer them. The doll is with me. It's a rag doll. Better said, it's a raggedy Ann doll. My father had many hobbies. He tried making dolls and was planning to sell them. But the first one he made was a raggedy Ann doll. So it didn't last. He was too manly to sell raggedy Ann dolls. Ridiculous, I know. And he gave me that one. And actually, he made four more for my best friends. The doll was hanging in my room, but once he passed, I hung it in the living room. It has X's as eyes, and it looks creepy. It has a GPS because my home was robbed seven months ago. I don't care if they clean out the house as long as they leave the doll. I have more expensive items she could have stolen, so I don't know why she would steal the doll other than a sick joke. My girlfriend never complained about it, at least not to me. I haven't talked to her other than telling me to drop the charges. I will talk to her tomorrow to find out why she let her friend take the doll. They've been here before and never did anything like this. And about our relationship, because right now, I'm thinking about breaking up. Not the jerk, but your girlfriend is for being upset with you rather than the friend who literally stole from you. Don't drop these charges, dude. Stand your ground and maybe rethink if you want to be with a girl who's okay with sentimental items made by your father being stolen from you. Oh, and change your locks, but don't give her a new key. Not the jerk. Jess could have saved herself from the hassle of police involvement by not stealing or by just fessing up and returning the doll once caught. Your girlfriend could have saved Jess from the hassle of police involvement by telling Jess to cut the crap once she knew the doll had a tracker in it and was unequivocally being stored at Jess's place. You gave them every option to do the right thing, it's not your fault they chose poorly. Also change your locks, your girlfriend is obviously not trustworthy enough to have unmonitored access. Well who do you think is the jerk, OP or his girlfriend and Jess? Please let us know. I want to know why you'd even be willing to stay with her after this crap. You want eye contact? Okay sir. Background. I used to work retail in a DVD slash CD store that rhymes with manatee. It's in Australia. We had computers that we could use to find certain titles and artists in the store if we had it in stock or we could even order from any of the other 300 plus stores in the country and have it shipped to the store. Many people would use this for older CDs or collector items that were harder to get. One day an older bloke came in asking about a certain smaller 80s rock band. I can't really remember the name. I looked on the computer for him and was about to track down their album names, which of those albums he wanted, located the album in stores around the country and got his details to enter into the computer for when the albums arrived in stores so that we could contact him. He thanked me and said that he was so happy we could get these albums in for him and left the store. The next day I get called into the boss's office because of a customer complaint. It was and is my only ever complaint in any job for the past 9 years of working. He had rang up and complained that while my service was lovely, I didn't make enough eye contact when I was using the computer. Cue malicious compliance. Three days later he came in because he had another band he wanted to order. Luckily I was working. As soon as he walked in, I greeted him with the biggest smile and locked him straight in the eyes. When he asked if we had any of his band in stock, 
I typed in the computer while maintaining direct eye contact. It took me about four tries to find the right keyboard letters as I wasn't that great at touch typing. He was starting to get annoyed, but he didn't voice it. Then I had to search what store location these albums were at. That took another couple of attempts to type. I turned the computer monitor around to the point it looked like I was going to snap it off. I had to move displays from the counter, which took more time, but finally I was able to set it up at such an angle that I could read it off with a quick glance but also still maintain eye contact. At this point, he started to squirm and look away, but I was only beginning. Next was his details and taking his deposit, normally $10. It took me a solid six attempts to enter his details into the system as you had to select each box to type in, and that was hard considering I wasn't looking. At this point, he had gone rather quiet and was looking at his shoes. When he handed me his money, I still maintained direct eye contact and even dropped it accidentally out of my hand which then led me to awkwardly slap around on the floor until my hand found it. Wouldn't want to break that eye contact looking for a few coins. After all the typing attempts, it took me an extra 10 minutes to serve him, all because I couldn't look at what I was doing. To this day, I've seen him a couple of times, but he won't come to my register, and he doesn't make eye contact or hides in the aisles until I'm busy with another customer. A shame, really. He had such lovely brown eyes. Am I the jerk for expecting my girlfriend to pay for her stay at my family's cabin? My grandparents own a big old cabin where every generation after them has enjoyed annual family vacations. Due to the cabin's age, there is constant maintenance that needs to be done. Every time we've replaced, fixed, or repaired something, there's another thing that needs fixing. We also started slowly renovating the cabin as the interior has become quite dated as well. These costs have become too much for my grandparents to handle alone, especially since their age means they can't do much of the work themselves and they need to hire professionals instead. This has caused them to implement a fee system. The rule is as follows. Every person from the age of 20 years old needs to pay an annual fee to be allowed to stay in the cabin. The size of the fee varies as it is calculated according to how many people plan on using the cabin and how big the upkeep costs were the previous year. I've happily paid this fee ever since the rule was implemented and so have my parents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Every summer, my extended family tries to find a weekend during the summer where most of our vacations overlap so that we can all meet at the cabin and catch up. I decided to invite my girlfriend along as I want to introduce her to this tradition, as she is someone I'm imagining spending many future summers at the cabin with. She was ecstatic about the idea of meeting my extended family and going to the cabin, as she's very curious about it after hearing me talk about it a lot. Naturally, I sat her down and told her about the rule and how she needed to pay, as everyone else paid, and it was only fair for her to do so as well since she would be using the cabin when coming with me this year. The year's fee is around $200 to $400, depending on how many people use the cabin, due to a big roof leak and some pretty substantial water damage. The idea of paying this fee really upset her and we had a big argument where she concluded with saying she would make other plans without me this summer. The rule is very simple and made completely fair on everyone. I don't understand why she thinks she should be exempt from this. My brother told me I should just pay her fee for her as my extended family really would like to meet her, but I really don't think that's fair for me to pay double the fee when she's completely capable of paying it herself. Am I the jerk? Edit. The cabin is not leaky anymore. All the damages were fixed this spring. My uncle handles the finances for this and usually pays for everything before calculating the individual costs at the end of the year. You're the jerk. She's perfectly within her right not to want to spend $200 to $400 for a weekend at a shared, broken-down cabin. It's not her family's property. She has no emotional attachments to it, and she may never reap the benefits of fixing it up. This. If she pays the fee and she only visits this one time and her and OP break up, is she still entitled to use the rest of her contribution? Two to four hundred dollars for the pleasure of staying in a broken down cabin with a leaky roof? I cannot imagine how moldy it smells. No thanks. You're the jerk. She's your guest, not a family member who agreed to pay into the communal fund. Paying two to four hundred dollars to stay in a crappy cabin for a weekend with a bunch of strangers is an absurd ask. Not the jerk. Part of planning and going on a vacation is deciding what fits in your budget and is worth the price to you. 
Visiting your family cabin may be worth $200 to $400 to you, but it isn't to your girlfriend. Paying $400 for a weekend in a cabin that you'll share with lots of other people? Don't think it's worth it for anyone. She'll be cheaper off renting a fancy Airbnb nearby and meeting you for dinner. Besides, while it makes sense to charge an annual fee to people who co-own the cabin, why would you also charge any additional guest? What kind of wear and tear do you expect her to do to the cabin in one weekend that would justify this kind of price? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. She's your guest, bruh. She shouldn't have to pay. Am I the jerk for banning my girlfriend from my hospital room? I have a medical condition which sent me to the hospital. I was taken to the hospital where my family and girlfriend were waiting for me. This is the first time I've had an incident and my girlfriend being available to come to the hospital. Only happened one other time and I didn't tell her until after the fact. She came into my room once the nurse gave permission. She asked if I was okay, got me a blanket and helped me out since I couldn't move much. She couldn't stay the entire time because she had to work early in the morning and I told her to go home and sleep got to the hospital about 10.30 p.m. The next day, she came to my house after work. I told her she had no right to be there yesterday at the hospital or even be in my room since she's not family and I didn't want her there. She told me my mom told her to go in her stead and to step back and let my girlfriend finally start letting her be the one to be there for me and my medical issues since we've been together for several years. Let her start taking wifely duties, I guess. I told her I want her nowhere near me before or after my surgery. Had to get surgery due to an injury from the incident. She seemed upset by all this and said I was being rude and hurtful. I told her I meant it and if she came, I wouldn't let her in my room or the building. About a week later, my mom and girlfriend were out and apparently my mom brought up about her being there for the surgery, which my girlfriend then told her what I said and will not be going since that's what I told her. My mom said I'm being a jerk for being mean and hostile to my girlfriend about it. I don't think I did anything wrong, even if I did yell at her. Am I the jerk? Some info. No, I didn't tell her before I didn't want her to come. It honestly just irritated me she came into my room. My family was still allowed in after she left. One visitor at a time was the rule. Updated, more info. I didn't tell her I was going to the hospital, my family did. Yes, I only consider someone family after it being legally binding on paper. I mentioned what she did in the room because that's just how it went. No, this isn't one of my many throwaways. There's just a lot of throwaways on this site, hence my name. Last edit. I've read about 1,000 of the comments as they came in. Yes, I am just that big of a jerk. No, this isn't made up and I wish it was. A lot of you really made me think about my actions and question why, so I will be seeking out therapy after my surgery and I'll show her this post. She said if I did something like this, that would be the outcome, and she was right. Thank you for all the you're the jerks. I'll answer whatever questions come through now. Info. Why are you dating someone you don't want around when you're sick? I don't understand your motivations here. Info. Do you actually like this woman? Like, at all? Because you talk about her like she's the world's biggest inconvenience when she shows up at the hospital, which is normal from someone you've been dating for several years and you don't give any reasons why you're mad at her. You chose an awkward time to tell your supposed girlfriend that she's unwelcome in your life. If she hasn't broken up with you over this, then she should be seriously considering it after the harsh words you said. You told her that she's not family with you after several years together? If you aren't partners by this time, you never will be. You're the jerk. Your mother talking about wifely duties was bizarre. But she wasn't wrong about you being the jerk when you were rude and hostile to your long-term girlfriend. You're the jerk, bro. She thought she was helping and you're being incredibly rude to her. It's your right to not have anyone there that you don't want there, but you could have went about it in a much different manner. Am I the jerk for demanding my husband pays to replace my camera that he threw out of the boat? I, female 32, was on a vacation with my husband and his family for five days to another state. Truth be told, I'm not too fond of his family as a whole due to their intrusive, pushy nature, but decided to go since he insisted. I brought my video camera with me to capture some moments with him and our four-year-old daughter. His family and his mom started complaining about not being included in the videos I recorded, but I already told them I wanted this to be a project for our small family, me, him, and our daughter. He told me that this isn't right and that's his family. 
His mom especially feels kind of disrespected by me continually excluding them from all of my videos. He suggested I take a video or two of them just to keep the peace. Well, I told him that this cost me money, but still said okay and took two videos, eight minutes long, of his mom, sister, her kids and husband and the others. That was still not enough apparently, as his mom wanted to be present in every video I take with my daughter. I was getting frustrated honestly. We got on a boat for a short tour and his mom saw me recording my daughter and demanded I record her, but I politely declined. She threw a fit and told my husband who gave me a horrible stare then demanded that I include his mom in the entire video, but I refused. He suddenly took the camera out of my hand and threw it into the sea. I verbally gasped and then looked at him and he sat back down nonchalantly, telling me I only got myself to blame for this. I was boiling inside. I looked over and I swear I saw his mom smirking. I had an argument with him, telling him in front of his family that I'm expecting and then demanding him to replace this expensive camera of mine and the tour was caught short. His family said that I, once again, ruined their trip after I packed my stuff and said I wanted to go home with my daughter. His mom remained calm while his dad defended him, saying that his son was pushed by me and acted out of frustration and that it was unrealistic of me to expect him to pay that much on something as unimportant as a camera. We went home and the fight continued. Now we're not speaking, but he keeps saying that I should have included his mom in the video and that I was no saint in this situation and shouldn't blame victim, much less demand anything from him. But I just wanted to make some memories with my daughter. Was I wrong to demand him to pay for a replacement? Get rid of him. I mean, the smirk is what took me over the edge. Get rid of him. Not the jerk, not the jerk, not the jerk. I mean, I know it's easier said than done, but get rid of him. This will be how it goes for the rest of your life. Not the jerk. This behavior on your husband's part is actually concerning. If he throws an expensive camera out of frustration over something as small as his mom not being included in a video, what's to stop him from escalating over something that actually matters big time? Everyone sucks here. I mean, yeah, your husband is the biggest jerk with destroying your camera, but it is so obnoxious and passive aggressive to be taking videos of a family outing and trying to keep some of the family out of the video. And it costs you money to record them? How? Are you stuck in the 90s and recording on tape? Why are you so bogged down in trying to make videos of how perfect your life is that you let it ruin your vacation and turn this into a big fight? It doesn't make sense to me that you're not including people in videos unless you're trying to do some special stages shot instead of just recording your life, including the extended family that is right there with you. This whole trip sounds like a nightmare from the beginning to end and if you dislike them so much, you want to passive aggressively make a film version of your life that doesn't include them, you should probably just have declined this vacation altogether. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Don't go on vacations with people you can't stand. It's drama just waiting to happen. My crazy ex showed up at the restaurant tonight and got arrested. I had a crazy partner well over a year ago. We broke up, restraining order, stopped hearing from him. Rumor was he had gone to jail for something else. That part of my life was over and done with. Until tonight, when he showed up at my restaurant. He's quite a bit older than me, so I had the advantage when I was in a bad place. It took a long time to convince myself he was 100% at fault. He showed up right in the middle of the dinner rush. Of course, he had to pick a night when a large group of girls I know from school were at a centrally located table, and the place isn't even that big to begin with. I spotted him right away. I think I saw him subconsciously before I even fully realized it because something felt chillingly off a few minutes before I first spotted him. We're still cutting back on staff to recoup lost income during lockdown, so I was the only one out on the floor. At first, I hoped maybe it was a coincidence that he didn't realize I worked there so he would just eat and leave. But no, he was drunkenly asking random patrons where to find me by name almost immediately. I wanted so desperately to ignore it and have him just leave of his own accord because these girls from school were right there and I did not want to be part of a big scene. But it became evident that he was not lucid, maybe something stronger than just the booze, and his behavior was escalating fast, could not be ignored. I went back and let the owner know what was going on, but just didn't feel totally comfortable sharing the whole backstory with him. When things first turned sour in the relationship, News got out to my family and friends before I was ready to discuss it 
and that fiasco is still an open sore. So I just told the owner, a guy I used to know has shown up drunk and belligerent, and I know him to be violent, so I was going to call the police. The owner said no problem. He would call and even offered to tag me out and handle my tables until the guy left, but I didn't want to let this guy chase me out of my own job or stop me from living my life ever again, even just for a few minutes. And our owner is a much older guy and not so great health. The restaurant is one of the only places his wife lets him go after lockdown, and even still, he has to stay in his office when it's busy. I kept working, and the owner came and sat at the bar, keeping an eye out on my ex. He was calling out my name and saying some pretty rude things and trying to get within arm's reach. The owner is pretty paternal towards me. I've worked in this place a long time, and we're a pretty small staff, so he wasted no time chesting up to this guy and telling him, Hey, the police have already been called. Do yourself a favor and get out. But my ex took that as a challenge and shoved this brittle old man. Hard. Patrons stepped in right away because it was so obviously not a fair fight between this big young guy and a little old man. But my ex can be scary and, understandably, no one was considering physically confronting him or getting between him and the owner or anything like that. So he was undeterred. He started to scream at me demanding I leave with him and he tried to run at me. The line cooks heard the commotion going on and a couple came out to see what the trouble was. Most of our cooks are scrappy but small and I think despite their egos, they knew from one look they'd need reinforcements. It had only been about 5-10 to 10 minutes since we'd called the police and in this busy city area, it takes them 20 minutes minimum to respond to anything that isn't imminently life-threatening. And all the owner had known to tell 911 at the time he called was we had a drunk and belligerent patron who might become violent. So we were definitely low on the priorities list. The line cooks went back and got one of my only real sort of work friends, coincidentally also the biggest guy on staff, Lenny. Lenny moonlights with an industrial moving company, so Stay is in superb shape and is also super heavy. So he's become kind of our de facto security ever since everyone forgot how to act in a restaurant during lockdown. I really don't know too much about where he comes from, but I know it's very difficult to rattle him. So Lenny comes out and quickly assesses the situation. Someone tells him what my ex did to our poor sweet owner and Lenny wastes no time. He tells this guy, You're leaving. You're leaving on your own, or... With the silence implying what the alternative was. At this time, all Lenny knew was some drunk guy showed up and shoved our boss, who we're all fond of. So my ex told him some slurred drunken crap I couldn't really understand, but it was clear from his tone that it was not complimentary. Lenny went up to escort him out, and my ex freaks out and tries to break the nearest glass in reach to use it as a weapon. Fortunately, the nearest glassware was a thick beer mug, and he couldn't break it. Lenny shrugged this off as a sloppy drunk overestimating himself and tried to go in and get him in some kind of an arm bar, but the owner warned him. Hold off. Tamira says he gets violent. Be careful. Lenny didn't know who this was yet, so he was like, This guy put his hands on her and was ready to charge him. But the owner's like, No, no, it's her old boyfriend. Lenny doesn't know the whole story with my ex. No one at work does. But he does know more than anyone else there, so instantly put together who he was dealing with. Without even hesitating, Lenny swung at him like a pinata. My ex's lights were out. He dropped onto the floor. A couple of patrons who had wanted to get involved but didn't see an opening were emboldened to step in now that my ex was unconscious and got on top of him to make sure he wouldn't be able to leap back up when he regained consciousness, which is good because he was back almost immediately. Still groggy, but more than able to have gotten up and retaliated had these men not stepped in. Someone else was behind the bar looking for something they could use to tie his hands together with. He found a roll of packing tape and right in the nick of time, because my ex was quickly getting his strength back and really fighting the guys restraining him. Lenny wanted to go launch back in on him, but the owner was talking him down, insisting it wasn't worth it. The Good Samaritans were trying to tape up his hands and feet, but the roll was nearly out, so it wasn't doing much. I was watching the whole situation unfold from behind the bar, just mesmerized and paralyzed with fear, almost like an out-of-body experience. Because it sounds like a long time when describing it, but at real life speed, this entire encounter from the time the owner came out to confront him couldn't have been more than three or five minutes. The police got there not too long after they had tried to tape him. It took three people to hold him down, one of whom got socked in the process, but they kept him secured until the cops got there. 
The police arrested him. My restraining order expired a year after it was granted, but I'm guessing they got him for the assaults or the disorderly conduct or something. And as they were cuffing him and going through the whole process, he was screaming that someone had assaulted him and he should be arrested as well. He was visibly injured, so the cops couldn't ignore that. They asked who had assaulted him and he pointed at Lenny. One of the patrons who had helped restrain my ex started to speak up saying, no, no, look, he did it in self-defense. This man was out of control. But his buddy cut him off and basically said, this guy was banged up when he walked in. I've been here the whole time and I didn't see anything. Then his friend who was initially offering Lenny a cover of self-defense realized the play and backtracked saying, yeah, yeah, we restrained him to defend ourselves, but nobody actually hit him. That other guy just works here which was a relief because Lenny is a gentle giant, but he's also kind of a mystery. So for all I know, he has priors that would have made proving self-defense difficult. The police dragged my ex out and took him in. I went home at that point, but I learned from the owner at the end of service that they also impounded the motorcycle he showed up on. That was a nice bonus. So it was all very scary. I'm glad to know my coworkers and customers have my back, but I still think I'll take a couple days off. Ultimately, just feeling grateful that I'm finally in a place where the good people in my life far outnumber the bad. Babysitting means paying your kids dental bills? Years ago, I would often babysit my neighbor's daughter who was about nine. He was a divorced father with the kind of an ex that would send spreadsheets of child rearing expenses calculated to the penny and weekly invoices complete with terms and penalties of her own choosing for late payments. He paid big child support and generally paid her invoices on time because she would cut off access to kiddo if he didn't. His ex, the snake, and I had basic text messaging contact. She and I had a previous dust up because a sudden weather change necessitated a jacket for kiddo. We popped into the nearest discount store and I let her pick a jacket. Kiddo loved it, but her mother threw a giant fit at me because it wasn't brand name. I blew it off and the neighbor and I laughed about it when he reimbursed me. She gave me the silent treatment. Darn. Time moved forward. Father always reimbursed kiddo's expenses and encouraged fun and healthy activities. One day, he called me and apologized that he was getting held up at work and kiddo had an orthodontist appointment. He asked me to take her, I agreed, and he called the dentist to authorize. We got there and they wouldn't see her without a payment, $225. It was necessary. Kiddo's braces were hurting her. Dad wasn't available, but I knew he would reimburse me, so I put it on my credit card rather than calling her snake of a mother. Kiddo got patched up, dad reimbursed me, I paid the card and didn't use it. A few months later, I got a past due call from my card company, repeat charges from the orthodontist. I let dad know and called the orthodontist who told me I signed an automatic payment agreement. I gave my, oh no, I'm just the babysitter speech and didn't get far with them, so I canceled the card. Dad apologized profusely and he reimbursed me. A month later, I get a nasty call from the orthodontist about my card declining. I kindly inform them that I'm not the parent and I provide the snake's phone number. About an hour later, the snake is furiously calling and texting me. I silenced my phone and looked later. She maxed out my voicemail and all of her text messages were about how wrong it was of me to deny her kid medical care. One voicemail was from the police letting me know that she filed a complaint how I could get a copy from my attorney and inquiring about whether I wanted to counter complain. I sure did. I moved out of state and the prosecutor called me once just to ask questions, then I never heard back from the prosecutor. Last I heard from kiddo's grandmother, the snake took a plea bargain, dad got custody, and grandma was enjoying a lot more time with kiddo. Am I the jerk for telling my housemate his girlfriend can't stay here anymore? I share an apartment with a friend I've known for years, we're both male 24. We've had this place for over a year and haven't had any real issues. We get along well and do heaps together. He works full time. I'm a university student and we split all bills, food and rent down the middle. We hate the idea of shared houses and just want it to feel like a home. A few months ago, he started seeing a girl, T, who spends every day and night at our place. T is also a university student and she can't stand her studio apartment. Until recently, I've had no issue with T being here and have never even asked her to pay for anything. She eats all meals at our place and takes food to uni if she needs. The way I see it, the housemate and I just buy a bit more food and it really doesn't matter. The other week, I got home from uni, went to the kitchen to make a coffee. I had an assignment I needed to work on, so I wanted to pick me up. 
and when I opened the fridge, I noticed some Red Bulls. I just assumed my housemate had bought them for us, so I grabbed one and drank it. The next morning at breakfast, T opens the fridge and then got super angry that one of her Red Bulls was missing. I said it was me and that I thought my housemate had bought them. She started telling me how she bought them for herself and how I should have asked and that I needed to apologize for taking it. I was going to tell T that it's my fridge and I shouldn't have to ask if I can have stuff in it, but I didn't want to start conflict, so I just apologized. She demanded I buy her a replacement. Since then, she started labeling any drinks or food she brings for herself and makes a point of saying it's hers. After all this, I've said to my housemate that I don't want her staying at our place unless she's going to start paying rent, paying for bills, and pitching in to pay for food. I don't want to pay for her anymore, just so that she can mistreat me for taking a drink from my own fridge. Am I the jerk? Update. Just to address some of the common things I've been reading, also, thanks all, it's nice to see only a few said I'm the jerk. I avoided saying anything at the time because my housemate and I are close to brothers and I don't want to fight like this to make him have to pick. Honestly, I know he would dump her and stick with me. Housemate is a great guy and I in no way think that he's trying to use me. When I've had girlfriends stay or we've had mates over, we've just kept to 50-50 as always. Sometimes people buy us food or pitch in as thanks, but we never expect it. He and I act more as family in a house rather than housemates, which is why it's never been an issue. T is very manipulative. As a side story, housemate and I always do a movie night once a week. It's our tradition and we love it. T has said she wants to join us and then every time, around 30 minutes in, she will whisper something to him or act a certain way and draw him away to go in the other room. Honestly, it's peeved me a tad as she is clearly just trying to assert some dominance there but I also joke with the housemate about it. I have laughed at the few comments calling me a pushover and I can see how it looks like that here. I normally am the first to stand up and react to something and can't stand people being rude. In this situation, it hasn't been an issue until this and my desire to not cause an issue was less about her, more about not wanting conflict with the housemate. Since I talked to him about her needing to pay or leave, she has spent more time at her own place but now just comes around and has the ability to destroy the mood in any room. I want them to separate. I think he can't see this lasting either, but she is hot and he doesn't think straight. Not the jerk. Your roommate may actually be violating the lease by letting another person stay over too much. But beyond that, you need to sit down with your roommate and try to set some reasonable visitation limits. Unfortunately, beyond getting the landlord to establish a no trespass on her, there's not much you can do to really enforce anything other than look for another place. Not the jerk. She has to chip in if she's staying over that much. It's still your house and your fridge. Petty solution. Write up all the things she consumes and present her with a bill or demand that she buys you a replacement. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the girlfriend? Please let us know. I want to know why she's drinking Red Bulls. Monster for the win, bruh. Am I the jerk for saying that I don't love my niece to her face? I know the title makes it look bad, but hear me out. I, 26 female, have a niece, Laura, who's 8, through my sister, Kim, who's 33, and another niece, Amy, who's 6, through my brother, Tom, who's 35. I know my siblings love their kids wholeheartedly, but when it comes to parenting, they each have different styles. This comes from the way that we were all brought up by our parents who use the, because I'm the parent and you're my kid, obey me without question, mindset that we all resented. Kim is the type of mother who just can't seem to say the word no, while Tom will at least give an explanation as to why. While Amy is a sweet, energetic girl, she does listen and know to respect people's rules and boundaries. Laura does not. Laura is entitled. Laura is impatient. Laura is whiny. Laura will go through a massive tantrum if she is denied anything and will get progressively worse the longer she's denied because she knows her mom will cave eventually. I haven't watched Laura since she was six and it was a nightmare. She yelled, screamed, kicked me, drew on the walls, and broke one of my framed pictures, all because I made her dinner instead of getting her fast food. Kim did apologize for Laura, but shrugged off the idea of giving out a punishment, citing that kids will be kids. Never again would I be responsible for my niece again. Amy, on the other hand, may need to be told something more than once, but ultimately is a respectful kid. I definitely babysat for Tom multiple times and do fun activities with Amy when I can. The coming August, before the start of school, I was planning on going with some friends to the Mouse Kingdom in Florida. Due to life events, they dropped out, but
but I still wanted to go and ask Tom if he and his wife would be down to come with me and I'd go 50-50 on everything with them. They were delighted and we all decided to go. Obviously, Kim found out and wanted to come too, but we all knew she couldn't afford it, so I thought everything was settled. Well, Laura found out and at our family dinner, she was super upset about Amy getting a surprise trip, but not her. She then looked at me and said, Auntie, you have a nice job and no kids. You can pay everything. I told her that while I may make more money than her mom, I can't pay for everyone by myself. Laura said, Yes, you can. You had money to pay for that car. She pointed to my new car in the driveway. You can pay for me and my mummy to go too. I refused and cue the tantrum. It was awful and she kept screaming, Why? And saying that if I really loved her, I'd make her happy by paying for the trip over and over. I kept refusing and she got worse before I finally snapped and yelled back that I didn't love her. Ouch. That she was a mean girl and that I didn't like being around her. That definitely shut her up for a moment before she started to sob and cry. Kim is berating me for being so heartless and that I'm evil for favoring one niece over the other. Am I the jerk? Bruh. Edit for clarification. 1. Yes, I am aware that Laura's behavior is on Kim's choice of parenting. 2. Yes, Tom and I have spoken to Kim about Laura's behavior more than once, but it falls on deaf ears. At the end of the day, we have no authority over Laura, so there's only so much that we can do. 3. Laura doesn't have a dad and Kim is a single mom, which is why she can't afford the trip. 4. I wasn't negotiating with Laura, I just kept saying no but that wasn't good enough for her. I tried to walk away, but she would keep following me, demanding that I pay. Five, I didn't tell Kim about the trip and neither did Tom, but we did tell our aunt and I think that's how Kim found out. Six, no, Amy didn't tell Laura because it was supposed to be a surprise. Everyone sucks here except your niece. She's just an annoying kid. You're an adult, you should know better. ETA, you're aware she's learning this from your sister? So why are you talking to her instead of being mean to the kid? Wow, that took a turn. You're the jerk. Saying those words to a kid was massive jerk move. This is a very sad post. Of course you're the jerk. The way you keep defending yourself in comments makes me believe you aren't going to gain anything from this experience. You were cruel to that kid. Hard stop. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her niece? Please let us know. Hey, at least she told her the truth. You want me to only go on my break when you tell me to? Okay, I'll do just that. This malicious compliance happened years ago and I remembered it while writing a YouTube comment. At the time, I was either in or just out of high school and I made money by bagging groceries at the local supermarket. This job was very interesting and there were a slew of terrible people employed at my location, but this story only has a cast of two people. Me, the overworked underpaid grocery bagger and my jerk of a supervisor, let's call him Ray. Ray was an absolute jerk to everyone in this store and nobody liked him. His shenanigans actually birthed my first romantic relationship, but that's a story for another day. The way my days at this job worked was I'd show up for a shift, clock in, and go up to whoever was supervising the front end that day. We had a rotation of three to four supervisors, and I was cool with almost all of them because I actually did my job, and asked them what the roster for the day looked like, who's here, when are we going home, if anyone's coming in, and breaks. I was particularly interested in my break time according to the roster, so I can plan my shift accordingly. Ray was one of those supervisors, and for some reason, he hated when people would ask when their break was. Somebody would ask, and then he'd scream about, when it's your break time, I'll let you know, which might have worked for the cashiers, but not us baggers, as we'd be all over the store and also getting carts. One day, I asked him when I'm supposed to go on my break, and he blew up on me, saying that he'll let me know when it's time for my break. I work the rest of my shift and tell someone else I'm going on my break at a reasonable time and while there's coverage. I come back from the break and he stopped me again to tell me he's in charge of the breaks. I say nothing and finish my shift. Cue malicious compliance. A few days later, he and I are working again. I know he's going to scream about breaks again, so I just don't ask. After all, he'll let me know, right? So instead of talking to the supervisor, which that day was Ray, and letting him know I'm here, I just start working and I continue working, and then I work some more. Finally, I realize seven of my eight hours have gone by, and I haven't had a single break. But Ray never did let me know it was time for my break. A few minutes after I thought this, 
Ray somehow finds out I've been working seven hours today with no break and he comes running up, screaming at me about how I didn't take a break and how dare I and the company is going to get into major trouble because they worked me seven hours without a break and then asked why I never took my break. I responded with, well, Ray, you said you'll let me know when it was time for my break and you never let me know, so I never took a break. He exploded again and screamed at me to take my break now and I finally took my 15 minute break, worked another half hour before clocking out to go home. Ray kept being a jerk about everything, but he always gave me my break times in advance for the next few months until he threw another fit at someone else and walked out of that store for good. Everyone else was completely amicable, and after Ray left, I had no problems with breaks again. Am I the jerk for walking out on my job with no warning when I'm one of the only employees? For context, I, female 18, have been working at this coffee shop for over two years now. I close four days a week with only me and one manager left to run the store from about 2 p.m. to close. The other three days, a kid, a guy who's 16, closes with a different manager. This is about the only staff we have excluding the owner who will never close. Another kid who's 19 who can only work day shifts due to college. Another kid who's also 18 who works days and does night classes and a grown man who works in the back baking all morning and he has another job in the afternoon, making him only available in the mornings. So they very clearly need me working there with them. I've been there for a while now and I really don't mind the people. They can be a bit rude sometimes, but I'm super shy and don't talk much anyway. So I stay out of everyone's way and just get all my work done. Anytime I've worked with my manager, she tells me about how I'm the best employee she's worked with and she likes how I just get stuff done. Fast forward to a week ago, I went inside of work on one of my days off to say hi, order a coffee and get a sandwich. I'm a vegetarian. I've struggled a lot with food and being able to eat enough for my whole life and I always had a hard time not getting grossed out when eating meat. So I stopped and my relationship with food got so much better. So I ordered a grilled cheese and got my coffee and I left. I was driving away and I went to take a bite. I take one swallow and it's fine. When I went to take another, I felt a super gross texture and I instantly spit out my food and pulled it apart. They put chicken in my sandwich. They know my diet and what I normally order. I was so upset but thought it was a mistake so I took the loss on the $3 sandwich, felt a little gross and moved on. The next day when I went into work, when I get there, there's normally a shift change so I get to see my other coworkers as they leave. I was talking to a guy in the break room while getting ready to work and he was about to leave. I casually made a little joke about how I'm never coming to this place again after they got my order wrong, just trying to mock rude customers, and I told him about my grilled cheese I ordered and how it came with meat. He laughed and told me that was actually our manager that made me that and it wasn't an accident. She wanted to pull a prank on me and make me try the chicken because she said it's delicious and she even gave it to me free of charge. After he told me what she said, I packed up all my stuff, took my hat and apron off and told the manager what I heard, how I'm done, and how disrespectful that was to do. I'm still getting calls and texts telling me how rude it was to leave with no two weeks notice and how much this shows that I'm just petty and I can't take a joke. They are so short staffed now that they close early and I know it's affecting their business. So am I the jerk? Not the jerk. What she did is food tampering. I believe that it's against health regulations and it can be a crime in some places. I don't know the rules where you live. Not the jerk. Two weeks is a courtesy, not a legal requirement. This established stop deserving your courtesy when your manager played a prank on you, forcing you to eat something you don't eat. You burned that reference, but given how crappy they're being about this, they probably weren't going to give you a good reference anyway. Not the jerk. They're lucky you're not suing them. It's never okay to mess with someone's food. They didn't know whether you had an allergy or some other health issue. That was not a prank, it was bullying. Good on you for standing up for yourself. I wouldn't have had the confidence at your age. Both are jerks. You don't mess with someone's order intentionally, but you also don't walk out of your job without notice. If you gave notice on the spot, I'd be fine, but not quitting with no notice. You won't be getting a good reference from there, obviously. Everyone sucks here. What your manager did sucks. Pranks that are good humored are usually fine, but they can go too far and it can be upsetting. But you suck too, because you just walked out, costing your business money and punishing your coworkers. You both behaved very childishly and you could have been the bigger person. Easier said than done sometimes, but still. Side note, just walking out like that will look really bad when you apply for future jobs. 
because if they call the manager and hear about what you did, you're out of luck. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for quitting on the spot or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for charging a $70 fee to family members who last minute canceled their RSVPs to my wedding? I, 26, female, just got married to my husband, who's 30, male. I have a rocky relationship with most of my family on my mother's side. I haven't seen my mother in roughly seven or eight years. We haven't spoken. The typical strained mother-daughter relationship. Regardless, I chose to invite some of my family from my mother's side to attend my wedding. It was small, so I wanted the important family to be there. While I, by no means, have great relationships with the people on that side of the family, they did a lot for me when I was younger, and I wanted them to be a part of this special day. My mother was not invited for a number of reasons. She's known to steal the spotlight and cause problems, plus she has openly shot down and berated my husband to family members, despite never meeting him on the basis that he is an artist, and that's how he makes a living. He makes far more a year than she ever has, a little ironic. So inviting her was just not a smart choice. Anyways, after sending invitations, word of course gets out on that side of the family that I'm getting married. I get a call from my cousin about three weeks before the wedding. She wanted to warn me that my mother had decided, for whatever twisted reason in her mind, to get married to her fiancé of now a couple of years on the exact same date. Keep in mind that my wedding was planned eight months in advance. A week before my wedding, I get a call from one of my aunts on that side, explaining that she will be unable to attend due to a family matter that has arisen. Code word for my mother's wedding, of course. As soon as I got that first call, I sent out a mass email to everyone explaining that anyone else who cancels last minute who has already RSVP'd will be charged $70 due to the catering and venue fees that would be wasted on them not being present. I would be able to enforce this given that all parties had to pay an additional $25 for each room that we booked for them at the hotel. So I had all their information and they were made aware of that charge. We paid for the rest of their room fees, by the way. Logically, I wasn't actually planning on enforcing this. It was just more of an, I know what you're all doing and I'm really mad about it move. So I spent about two days after that email dealing with nonstop phone calls from family on that side saying they had to cancel and it was absolutely ridiculous that I was forcing them to pick a side. I told them that they had RSVP to my wedding months before my mother's and coming to mind was also just blatant common courtesy. Long story short, that entire side did not show up, aside from my cousin who warned me of the whole thing. I'm still debating actually charging their cards $70, but I think it's too petty, and being honest, waiting and even thinking about this on my honeymoon isn't fun. I spent the second night in France crying on my husband's shoulder over this. So, am I the jerk? Update. I will not be charging the cards because… fraud. Thanks everyone for reminding me that those charges do exist and that my mother's side would most likely press them. Not the jerk, but cut all contact with everyone but the cousin that warned you. What a bunch of horrible people to be related to. Everyone sucks here. Congratulations, you played straight into your mother's hands and made yourself look like the unreasonable one instead of her. I'm sorry it cost you this much to learn that you can't count on your family of origin, but literally charging them for it will not fix or change that. Forget them and focus on the family you're building with your husband instead. Am I the jerk for hurting my mom's feelings? My kids, who are 12 and 8, are in gymnastics and eat a high-protein diet. Most of what they eat is meat and dairy. They usually have yogurt and fruit or turkey bacon for breakfast. My son is old enough to make his own lunch, so I let him make whatever he wants. Even though I don't supervise his choices, he almost always makes something like a chicken and cheddar sandwich on whole grain bread or tuna salad. My daughter is learning to make her own lunches too and usually copies her brother. Dinners are usually fish, steak, chicken, or turkey with a vegetable. My mom came to visit yesterday and we took her out to dinner to a nice steakhouse. My son got steak and mushrooms, which comes with a baked potato, but he asked for it to be substituted for a side salad. My daughter got surf and turf, which also came with a potato, which is fine. My mom teased my son for ordering a salad, which annoyed him. I told her to stop. She also tried to get my daughter to order off the kids' menu, but my daughter wanted shrimp and refused. I again told my mom to let them eat what they want. This morning, my mom made pancakes for breakfast before any of us got up. When my son woke up, he went to the fridge and got yogurt and blueberries. My mom told him to put them back because the pancakes were almost done. My son refused. They started arguing, which is when I came out, and again told my mom to cut it out. 
She said it was rude to get something from the fridge when someone is cooking for you. I said that the kids can eat what they like. When my daughter came out, she got some yogurt and sat with her brother to split the blueberries. My husband and I ate the pancakes, but my mom was upset. She said she wanted to take us all out to lunch to thank us for dinner. She took us to a pizza place. My son wanted the chicken parmesan. My mom said, no, he'll have pizza. I told the waiter to bring us the chicken parmesan on a separate check and I'll pay for it. My mom, again, accused me of being rude. My daughter asked for a slice of meat lover's pizza. My mom gave me a smug look and praised my daughter, which I could tell annoyed my son. When the food arrived, my daughter asked for some of my son's because it looked yummy. My mom said, no, eat your pizza. My daughter said, I will, I wanna try the chicken. My son cut her a portion and put it on her plate. He said, I'll try some of your pizza too so grandma stops being mean to me. My mom scowled at him and told me to reprimand him, but I refused and said she was, in fact, being mean to him and kids aren't stupid and can tell when someone is rude to them. The rest of lunch was awkward and now my mom is hiding in the guest room. Husband thinks I should clear the air with my mom before the kids get back from practice. He said I didn't help anything and should apologize, otherwise I might as well get her a hotel because the rest of the trip will be miserable. I may have been hard on her. Was I a jerk to my mom? Not the jerk. Why is your mom so set on controlling what the kids are eating? Isn't it better that they're at least picking healthy options versus gorging themselves on sweets? OP. I think she doesn't approve of their activities and is trying to prove something to me. She thinks they aren't having a real childhood. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or grandma? Please let us know. Tell grandma she can take us out for pizza whenever she likes. I could really go for some CCs right now. Am I the jerk for demanding my neighbors return my daughter's bike that she gave them? Yesterday, I noticed my daughter, 12, came home without her bike, looking a little upset. I asked her where her bike was, and she said she gave it to her friend who lives across from us. Now, I'll be honest, I was upset to hear that she gave away her bike as I'm a single mother of eight. Side note, don't judge me. Only four of my kids are biologically mine. The rest I adopted due to my friend passing and my sister's mental health problems. I worked extremely hard to get my daughter that bike. It was literally over a thousand dollars, but my daughter really wanted it and loves it, so it was also a surprise to me. But I let it go, because at the end of the day, I bought my daughter that bike. It's not up to me to control what my daughter decides to do with it. Later that day, I hear my daughter crying in her room, so I knock on her door to make sure she's okay. She broke down and admitted that her friend's mom pressured her into giving away her bike, even though she didn't want to. Now my daughter has already given her friend her old bike after she upgraded, so I honestly don't understand how selfish this woman is. The next day, I went over to the neighbor's house to speak to the mom without my daughter and demanded she return the bike, telling her that she better return the bike or I will report it as stolen and that she had no right stealing my daughter's bike from her. She denied stealing it, but in the end gave my daughter's bike back. She told me that I'm a psycho jerk who clearly has issues and that she doesn't want her daughter involved with people like me, so she'll no longer be allowing her daughter around mine. When I told my daughter that, she became really upset and blamed it on me. My daughter was really close to the neighbor's daughter and is now mourning losing a friend. I now feel like I approached the whole situation wrong and that I could have been more sensitive about the whole issue in order to salvage the friendship. Your daughter is 12, so any agreement she makes with an adult is not valid. That's your bike, not your daughter's. By the way, you have eight kids and you have a thousand dollar bike for a 12 year old? What? When she gave it away, you initially just let the issue go? Are you okay in the head? Your daughter is upset, big whoop. You'll see her upset a thousand more times. It's life, she'll be fine. OP, I'm always trying to evolve with my parenting. I just feel like if I give my daughter something, then I don't own it anymore, as it would be with anyone else. But I can see your point, and I could always learn and improve. My daughter is a really athletic person. I try my best to encourage her in whatever she loves doing. She's currently in boxing classes and also does cycling with a group of kids her age. Mailman wasn't trying to deliver my packages. I got revenge. For context, in my country, if your package gets sent through the National Post Service, you're basically done for. It takes 200 years and they never actually deliver it. I don't know how it is in other countries, but here they're supposed to ring the doorbell if the package doesn't fit the mailbox, and if you don't answer, they leave a notice and you have to go pick it up all the way at the post office. The problem is that my mailman doesn't even try to deliver them. 
He just leaves the notice without even ringing the doorbell and leaves. I've had to pick up nearly every package I've ordered because of that. Well, this time it was my last straw. I was obviously home because of lockdown. Suddenly, I received a call that immediately hung up. It was so fast that my phone didn't even ring, just showed up as a missed call. No doorbell, no nothing. I suspected it was the mailman and ran to the door only to find him inside the truck, looking straight at me before driving off. Well, I was upset and I called the post office to file a complaint. I explained the situation and the lady told me that I couldn't file a complaint because they are only instructed to ring the doorbell and calling is optional and I couldn't prove that he didn't ring it. At first, I just avoided using them again at all costs, but the other day I ordered something and chose a delivery company from the ones listed on the website. Apparently, that company hires the National Post Service to deliver for them here. When I found out, I basically stalked the tracking info for days. It was about two weeks late. Until one day, late at night, it said it had arrived in my country, which usually means that the next day it's going to be delivered. The next day, I woke up at 7 a.m. to check. My suspicions were correct. It said, out for delivery. I quickly grabbed something to eat, got in my car, and parked right outside of my house. Then I waited and waited and waited. Six hours in total until I finally see the post truck pulling over. I grabbed my phone to record and watched as the mailman opened the door already with a notice in his hand and slid it inside my mailbox and turned around. I got out of the car and said, Excuse me, what are you doing? He didn't even look at me and said, Just delivering packages, miss. Then I stood there as that jerk grabbed his phone to call me and quickly hung up. I smiled as I took my phone out of my pocket and sarcastically stated, Oh, bummer, you didn't even give time to reach for the phone. He literally turned white. He couldn't even speak. I continued, Now, can you give me my package, please? He quickly opened the truck, almost tripped, and took out my package. See, wasn't that easier than your whole scheme? He finally manages to say, Sorry, miss. I turned around and left. He probably thought he got lucky I didn't say anything else, but little did he know that I sent the video to the post office via email attached to my complaint. Well, let's just say I got a new mailman. This one tries to leave one second after ringing the doorbell, but at least he rings. Edit. 1. Everyone saying I should just install a camera. That would work, yes, but then he would leave with the package and I would have to go pick it up. I wanted my package that day. 2. For everyone saying I got him fired and that's not something to brag about, Firstly, as much as it isn't his fault and he's just following orders, he was not nice or professional. He literally saw me at the door one time and drove away while looking at me. Secondly, we don't even know if he was actually fired. I might be wrong, but I think here the regular mail carriers are considered public employees, which means they are rarely fired, just transferred to a different job. My mother-in-law is threatening to sue me for grandparents' rights. I, 28 female, have been married to my husband, 30 male, for two years, and we've been together for almost 10 years. I love my in-laws and have never had an issue with them, at least before I was pregnant with my first baby. My mother-in-law has one other daughter, let's call her Jane, but she lives across the state. She has two boys and is done having kids. She lives close to her mother-in-law and the boys are pretty close to her, which obviously causes some jealousy issues with my mother-in-law. My whole pregnancy has been one big guilt trip about how she never got to be there for Jane for her pregnancy. She would touch my belly or get really close to it to talk to the baby. I would tell my husband that it made me uncomfortable and while he was understanding, he also felt bad for his mom too and reminded me about how she missed many moments with Jane. During the last couple months of my pregnancy, we made the decision to move in with my in-laws to save money for a house. This made my mother-in-law so happy. She kept telling everyone she was excited for the baby to come home to her. I let those comments slide for a while, but finally had to confront her about my baby shower. My parents bought us a crib and nursery decorations for my registry, and my mother-in-law made a joke to my mom how good everything is going to look in her, my mother-in-law's, room, and that she's basically going to be our live-in nanny. My mom has never had any reason to dislike my in-laws, but these comments were very off-putting. I had to sit down with my mother-in-law about boundaries and she started crying and said she just wanted to feel close to at least one of her grandkids. I tried not bringing up the topic after that, but she didn't make it easy. The thing that gets me upset the most is the constant need to have all the baby firsts. She wants to be the first to do everything and it's so hard to tell her no. Until one day, 
She waited until I left the room at dinner time. When I came back, my husband excitedly told me how much the baby will love mashed potatoes and that my mother-in-law gave her a small spoonful and she went nuts. My mother-in-law said, You weren't supposed to tell her. It was grandma's little secret. I snapped. I said, That's my kid and there will be no secrets no matter how small. Things got tense and I got called dramatic and that she's allowed to have grandma moments with my kid, whatever that's supposed to mean. I think my last straw is this. My husband and I have just been approved for our loan and will be signing papers on a house soon, about 45 minutes away from my in-laws. Lately, she's been going on about how it's unfair to her and how she doesn't know how to handle her baby being so far away. She's jokingly brought up suing for grandparents' rights or about setting up her new room. I wouldn't be so upset if it was one or two jokes, but after hearing about it daily, it's starting to feel less like a joke and more like she wants to take my baby. Am I the jerk for wanting to have another sit down? Not the jerk. She has a serious jealousy and boundary issue and should talk to someone to get her some help with it. Do not give this woman a key to your house. Not the jerk. I'd be having a sit down with you, your husband, your mother-in-law, and if she's married, her husband, laying down the ground rules. If mother-in-law doesn't abide by them, she gets put in a timeout until she learns to respect her role as grandmother, not mother. The threats of suing for grandparents' rights is highly dependent on the state y'all live in, but until she knocks off the threats, I'd limit her time that she gets to spend with the baby. Move out ASAP. She obviously gets highly dependent upon fantasized connections and will only get more attached, not the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or mother-in-law? Please let us know. I never got to meet any of my grandparents, but if I could have and they really loved me, I think I would have turned out different. Manager insists I do my job properly. Happy to comply, sir. Preface. In early 2020, I was hired under the title assistant manager at a local automotive shop. We mainly sold tires and alloy wheels for passenger vehicles. The company owned several stores. I reported directly to my manager, who then reported to the owner of the company. Shortly after I was hired, I noticed the behavior of the manager was far from professional. He would constantly mock and berate me for being the new guy. I believe part of this was jealousy and insecurity on his part, as I ended up recording more sales under my name within the first few months. He would also knock off, work early, and start drinking beer whilst the rest of us continued to work. I remember when he found out that I participated in MMA training sessions after work, he tried to goad me into a fight for his own amusement. Clearly, this guy didn't like me, and I was starting to get the feeling that he was trying to get me to snap or lose my cool, and as a result, my employment. I became even more certain of that with what happened next. Story. During the few months that I had worked there, I had noticed that our takings for the day and sales records did not match. I would often spend half an hour to an hour after work trying to figure out where the errors were coming from, whilst the manager would simply throw his hands in the air and exclaim that he had no idea how this was happening. The recurring issue seemed to be that our cash takings had been recorded incorrectly. There would sometimes be an excess amount of cash that didn't match up to what was recorded on our sales and invoicing software. Other times, there would be less. I was, at the time, an accounting student studying towards my bachelor's degree. I was already suspicious of the cash being taken out each day. However, given how the manager had been treating me up until this point, I was concerned that any complaint would somehow be twisted and used against me. And boy was I right. Several weeks later, my manager took some time off. During this time, I managed a personal record in store sales and also noticed something interesting. The cash was never out at the end of each shift. I reported this directly to the owner of the company, given I was acting manager during the time my manager was away. I was expected to report to the owner every day and explained what had been occurring whilst the manager was there. In all honesty, I was hopeful that the owner would be having a word with the manager about the discrepancies. However, I was also weary as I believed once the owner spoke to my manager that the manager will immediately know it was me who reported this. When the manager returned to work, he immediately approached me with a disgruntled look on his face. I've spoken with the owner. You tried to blame me for the discrepancies? You should focus on doing your job properly. Then this wouldn't happen. I was quite taken aback by how angry he was, though I wasn't surprised that he twisted it and tried to place the blame on me. Given his reaction, I'm even more suspicious at this point. He wants me to do my job properly, eh? Cue malicious compliance. That same week, I got to work. 
I started paying attention to what customers were paying when they were dealing with my manager. Behind his back, I began examining all of his sales transactions and invoices with a fine comb. As the days rolled by, I started to find evidence of his dishonesty. When it came to a few cash sales, my manager was doing the following. Example, would tell the customer the price is $200 if he pays cash, would discount the price by $50 in the sale and invoicing software, would put the extra cash into the till and record a $150 cash sale. Before we did the cash up at the end of the day, he would sneakily pocket this extra cash whilst no one was around, though he was very foolish as he clearly couldn't remember the exact amount he had swindled. Hence why the cash would be up some days, didn't swindle enough, or the cash would be down, swindled too much. I took screenshots of the discounts he had been giving on sales and sent them to the business owner along with a report. A report with a detailed description of my findings. The report also showed that on all days he wasn't there for the cash count, there was no variance. When he was there, well, the owner was infuriated. This man had been his trusted employee for years. The owner was so infuriated, in fact, that he ordered my manager to do a mandatory drug test on the same day he found out, and no surprise, he failed. Turns out the manager had quite a bad habit. This was most likely his sole motive for stealing the cash, and the owner was beside himself. We operate machinery every day in this store, and so the thought of a manager walking around after he had been doing something like this wouldn't sit well with any health and safety professionals. In fact, it could have landed the owner in serious legal trouble if any accident or injury occurred under his manager's watch. The manager was terminated immediately for violation of his contract and was later taken to court by the owner in an attempt to recover the stolen funds. Safe to say, I was promoted to store manager position shortly after his termination. Am I the jerk for leaving a bad review on a small store? So my boyfriend and I have a tradition for our anniversary that we each go to a store and separate. And after we buy each other gifts, we exchange in the car. It's silly and cute. We walked into this new mom and pop anime store. I'm a huge anime nerd and my boyfriend likes video games, which they also sell. We separate and I go look at stuff for my boyfriend. A worker walks up to me and starts chatting, then points at my leg. I have a pretty big tattoo from Naruto on my thigh, among other anime tattoos. He asks if I got that for my boyfriend, and I said no, I've always loved Naruto, and then I showed him my other anime tattoos. He started quizzing me on the lore of the anime, and I told him I wouldn't have spent $1,000 on tattoos of an anime I didn't know about, and I didn't appreciate him trying to catch me in a gotcha moment. He then told me that he didn't believe I could ever fully understand the real story of Naruto and the depth behind it. I told him I didn't need his services, and he can go back to the front desk. He told me I was a rude wannabe jerk and walked into the back and I continued purchasing my items. I left a review later that basically said one of the employees called me names when I didn't want to prove my nerd cred to him. The owner left a comment on my review asking for an email conversation and asked that I take down my review because people have started complaining about this employee as well as his sale revenue has dropped. I told him I wouldn't and maybe he shouldn't hire jerks if he doesn't want bad reviews. My friends tell me that I'm overreacting. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. As if Naruto is some grand epic that's hard to understand. A 12-year-old could understand it. OP. I love Naruto, obviously, but it's really not that deep. Not the jerk. You're not overreacting. If the store owner wants to get his revenue back, he can fire the jerk. You are under no responsibility to put up with this kind of treatment. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Not the jerk. I'd edit my review to add what the owner did with screenshots. Well, what do you think? Should OP remove the review or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. That would kind of defeat the whole purpose of what reviews are for. I exposed my manager as a hypocrite. Backstory. I work in a residential facility for people on probation. They can serve out a sentence there on work release or if they're sentenced to our treatment program. So they come and go a lot. Part of my job is sending anything new they bring back to the property office to be inventoried or held as contraband. Stuff that isn't illegal, but they can't have in the facility, like chewing tobacco. They're not allowed to bring outside food or drinks, so part of my job is throwing it away if it's perishable or unwrapped. This guy returned with a bag of burgers and burritos his job was throwing away, so I disposed of it and he complained to the policy compliance manager who runs the property office. She told me that I had to get with that client for financial reimbursement. 
I tried getting her to understand that I threw that stuff away because it would not keep back in the office, as her own policy states, and she didn't care. Her words to me were, Property officers are the ones who sort through the property for contraband or disposable items. Your job is not to review the property, just bag it up and label it with their name. Everything goes through property. She even underlined the word everything in her email. It felt like she was making up her own rules, despite what policy said, because she didn't want to deal with a complaining work release inmate. The malicious compliance. Yesterday, a client returned with a half-eaten bag lunch we provide people leaving for work in case they can't feed themselves. I saw my opportunity. I did exactly what you think and sent a brown bag of half-eaten sandwich and cornbread to be inventoried as property. I saw her email today going off on me for being passive-aggressive or that I need to be retrained. She normally doesn't CC anyone in her emails about issues, but she did today. My direct supervisor, the operations commander, and the deputy director were all included so they could see her complaining at me over the half-eaten food I sent her staff. She must have felt like Obi-Wan having the high ground. Too bad she did in fact underestimate my power. I included even more supervisory staff in my response and directly quoted her original emails to me and pointed out that she had told me her staff were the ones that throw things away and that I was to bag and tag everything. I was later told by my laughing supervisors that the director himself laughed as he told her, you told him to send you everything, you can't get upset because he did what you said. Edit. Some of the comment notifications I'm getting are from people apparently really upset that I'm throwing food away. While I do agree, it's important to look out for people trying to get their life together on probation. Please let me reassure you that we feed them three meals a day in our cafeteria make them food trays to be saved for later in a fridge, set aside specifically for people who miss meals due to their work schedule, and always have bag lunches made fresh daily for them to take with them when they leave. There are even vending machines available to them. We are not starving them if they try to bring in outside food. The rules about outside food are made clear to them day one. Chill. Am I the jerk for not wanting my husband's other kid in my house? My husband cheated on me while I was pregnant and had a baby with another woman. I found out after the other kid was born. I've never been okay with this. It's exactly the kind of stuff I tried so hard to have not be a part of my life. If it was possible, I would have divorced him by now, but I'm stuck at a legal dead end and it's not possible. We have a legal and emotional separation agreement though. Since he travels a lot and between the baby, my parents and my career, I've been able to avoid thinking too much about it. Well, so I thought. It's been almost two years since then and now he wants to bring that kid into my house. I guess he has some kind of schedule with the other kid's mother that includes visits, and he wants that visitation to be in what is technically still his residence. Absolutely not. I'm not a stepmother to any kid, and unlike in most of these situations, the house we're living in is truly only mine. It's under my parents' names, but I got it when I got POA, and they had to go into a care home. I'm not having this kid in it. My husband and our family say that I need to deal with it because I'm still married, that I need to accept my stepkid, and that I'm a jerk for excluding a baby and preventing siblings from having a relationship. I don't agree. This kid may technically be siblings to mine, but I don't need to play mom to this kid to make a relationship happen, and I don't want any of this crap coming into mine or my kid's safe space. Am I crazy for not wanting this kid here? Edit. Why can't you get divorced? Why is he still living there? In my state, to file for divorce, both parties need to have been separated for over a year and living in separate residencies, which requires one of us to move out. He doesn't want a divorce, so of course he won't move out. I can't make him because we're still married. In theory, I could move out and start the clock, but realistically I can't. With the POA, I can't just abandon the house. I couldn't afford to anyway, but even if I did, he would be able to remain there. I would eventually get the house back, but in the meantime, he could easily destroy it, and then I'd have legal problems from that. To clarify on the separation agreement, those don't technically exist in my state, but since we have it notarized, we could use it as an interim agreement on custody and the split on finances once that clock starts, and especially post-filing. Edit 2. Adultery at fault. I could file based on adultery. I don't really want to go that route, because it would turn the entire situation very hostile very quickly and I would still have to have him living here until we could get a court date, which could easily be months and months in the future anyway. I realize it already seems as hostile as possible right now, but day to day things are civil in a way that it wouldn't be if I did that. 
I also am not confident that it wouldn't look bad because I would have been waiting two years after knowing about it to do anything. Not the jerk. This may not be a popular opinion since most on here say you have to be a perfect step-parent and accept all situations, but you are not at all the jerk. I was in a similar situation and still get upset 30 years later. Don't let people tell you what to do or how to feel. It's your house. Tell the father to go someplace else. Also, typically, the partner is aware of the spouse having kids prior to moving in and getting married. A step-parent that tells their partner they don't want anything to do with the kid in question is different as they knew before, so now they have to live with it as it was always part of the deal. This situation is different. She doesn't even want to be in a relationship with the father. It's exactly like all the other stories that we see recently where the OP is divorced and the ex wants the OP to take care of the step and have siblings for a weekend or something, and each time the OP is not the jerk. The only difference is that she's stuck living with the other parent, and the other parent is using legal loopholes to stay there and stay married, twisting OP's hand as it is. OP, I'm sure you checked all you could legally do in your state and have already thought of it, but just in case, since it's technically not your house, do you have the power of attorney? Is an eviction notice possible? Get a lawyer, a good one. He will bring his other kid. You need a lawyer to evict him. A lot of people who share a residence go through divorce. It shouldn't be this hard without another way out. Get a lawyer and filed for divorce and evict him. Not the jerk. Not your kid, not your responsibility. And furthermore, in my opinion, that wouldn't be right having you look after the kid from his affair. Am I the jerk for accidentally telling my fiancé I don't like his sister and she won't be a part of my wedding? This situation is literally ridiculous, but this whole thing has caused a huge divide across the family, so I'm here to get a consensus. Throwaways for privacy, even though there's a good chance my fiancé will see it. I, 26 female, have been with my fiancé, Chris, 26 male, for four years now. He and his sister, 21 female, Lilac, are very close. They had a pretty rough childhood and always promised each other to be there no matter what. Lilac is a good sister to him, but as a person, truthfully, I can't stand her. She's literally the textbook definition of a bubbly blonde. She is overly charismatic, always giggling, and in general, just acts too immature for my taste. She likes to pull pranks every once in a while on my fiancé and he gets her back, but the whole ordeal just seems childish and obnoxious to me. Ever since we got engaged, I knew I didn't want her in my wedding party because that means I'd have to spend time with her at my bachelorette and other parties. Fast forward to last night and my fiancé asks me when I plan on asking Lilac to be a bridesmaid. I got quiet and truthfully said I didn't plan on doing so. This upset him because he said he wants his sister to be a part of the most important day of his life and that if I didn't do it, he was going to make her a groomswoman to make sure she's included. I can't lie, this set me off. I went off about how I want to feel respected by him and be able to enjoy my wedding day. He said he also wants to enjoy his day, which to be fair, I understand. This is where I may be the jerk. I told him that I have always disliked his sister and wished he would just not include her for once on a day that isn't even about her. He got quiet and went into our guest room to be alone. A couple of minutes later, I got a text from Lilac that she completely respects my decision to not want her in the wedding party, but she's hurt to know what I actually feel about her. I didn't want her to find out at all, and now he's told his whole family about our argument. Half of them are attacking me, and half of them are saying it's my day, so I should be able to enjoy it. Honestly, this whole ordeal is stressful for no reason, because Lilac isn't even upset I don't want her in my wedding party, yet the whole family is upset, and my fiance has been very short with me all day. Am I the jerk? Edit. Just because I don't like her personality doesn't mean I'm mean to her. Being around her drains my social battery, but I've never been mean to her, nor did I want her to find out, ever, especially in this way. I'm just super introverted, and our personalities collide. I don't want her at my bachelorette party because I want to enjoy it fully and not feel anxious the whole time because the personification of a human firecracker is attending. You're the jerk. You didn't want her in your wedding party because that means you'd have to spend time with her at your bachelorette party? Boy, do I have some bad news about what's going to happen if you actually marry her brother and legally bind yourself to him and his family for the foreseeable future. To be clear, you're free to not want to have her in your wedding, but if she's going to be your sister-in-law, you might have to get over your distaste of blondes who've, checked list, been bubbly and happy. Don't worry, she may be able to avoid lilac permanently 
The fiancé is rethinking this wedding as we speak. We can only hope OP is correct and her fiancé sees this post despite the anonymous account and change names. He needs to understand how toxic OP's behavior is so he'll finally call off the engagement and break up with her. I agree. While it is okay to not like someone in your partner's family if there's a good reason for it, my mom doesn't like her sister-in-law because it always has to be about her. My sister's wedding, my grandma tried to convince my sister to do something special for my aunt so she doesn't feel left out. OP literally has no reason to not like her. It seems like Lilac is genuinely a good person and knowing that OP doesn't like her probably really, really hurt her. Just because someone is always in a good mood doesn't mean you shouldn't like them. This is like insanely toxic behavior. So she's happy and enjoying life and this bothers you? Might want to do some inwards reflection there, bud. You're the jerk. It's your fiance's wedding too. It's not all about you. You're the jerk and you sound jealous of their relationship. It's not just your wedding, it's his wedding too. And if you don't want her there as a bridesmaid, then that's fine. But it's unfair for you to dictate that he can't have her on his side and blow up at him for wanting to include her. Lots of selfishness on your end. That's not a great way to start a marriage. It's not even like she's major drama. You just find her too giggly and obnoxious. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her fiance? Please let us know. Has there ever been a wedding where there weren't people fighting about something? Am I the jerk for telling my pregnant sister she needs to go and making her move out? My sister, Allie, is currently seven months pregnant with a daughter she's planning to name Violet. Allie moved in after she discovered she was about two months pregnant. She and her boyfriend agreed beforehand that they didn't want to settle down and wanted to stay childless. Her boyfriend had a vasectomy and they take other precautions, but Allie still got pregnant. Allie said that getting pregnant changed her mind about not settling down and she wanted her and her boyfriend to get married so they could raise the baby together. Her boyfriend said he would pay child support and other things, but because of some stuff that happened in his childhood, he knew he wouldn't be a good enough father for Violet. They are still in somewhat contact, but have broken up. Several family members offered to let Allie move in as well, but she chose to move in with me. Since she's moved in, Allie has been a nightmare. She's nice to others, but vicious towards me. Just recently, I didn't buy the right brand of sliced raisin bread. Allie wanted a different brand than the usual, but neglected to tell me that. And she went off on a tirade about how I was a failure in life, and it wasn't surprising my ex cheated on me. Allie never apologizes for her tirades and thinks I should just get over them because the hormones are giving her mood swings. Allie does not work at the moment and also does no help around the house. She's capable of moving, she goes to friends' houses, but will not pick up after herself because she claims those specific chores cause her immense pregnancy pain. Allie expects me to be her servant because she's pregnant. She once made me drive almost three hours to bring her food from the specific Italian restaurant because Violet was craving lasagna, it's for her. Anytime I put my foot down or am not 100% cordial with her, as in being tired instead of super enthusiastic, Allie will call my mother and she and other family members will shame me because they say I'm being a jerk to always expect Allie to be perfect when she's in pregnancy pain and I will never know the demand of pregnancy on your body. I explain my side, but they argue the same things along with how I should just help Allie because stress is bad for the baby. The tirades and demands for special food and items because Violet wants them have become daily occurrences. So I told Allie last week that we needed to talk. I explained to Allie that I love her, but I just can't deal with her right now. I said I would help her move out and helped pack and bring her things to my mother's. Now my family members are calling me a jerk, saying I kicked out my own sister when she's pregnant. How Allie always looked out for you. Allie's four years older than me, and this should have been my turn to take care of her. How Violet's father isn't going to be in her life, and now she has an uncle who threw her out. I just can't handle Allie because of how physically and mentally exhausted I am. So, Reddit, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. OP, if your family members are so concerned with her, she can move in with them. And the boyfriend needs to visit the doctor he had his procedure done at and get tested to see if he's even capable of being a father, as it's very likely that Violet is not his baby. Well, what do you think? Should OP kick his sister out or not? Please let us know. I see why her ex didn't want to stick around, and I do hope he actually gets a paternity test. Am I the jerk for not wanting my girlfriend to decorate my apartment? I, 29 male, have been with my girlfriend, 24 female, for two years now. We have not lived together before, but she's currently 18 weeks pregnant, so I suggested that she move in with me once her lease was up. 
It ended at the end of June, so she's been living with me for almost three weeks now. While we get along well and overall living together has been great, I've noticed that she's started to change things around my apartment. She only brought a few things over since my apartment is fully furnished, so I understand her need to make it feel more like her space. Everything in my apartment is mid-century modern. It's a mid-century modern building and I bought the apartment because of how much I love that style. Some of the things that she's suggesting or bringing into the apartment absolutely do not go with the vibe. She's taken down some of my artwork and replaced it, cleared off shelves I curated and put her knickknacks on it, went through my pantry and cleared out things she thought were unhealthy, all without asking me. She works from home while I work in the office, so she has a lot more time at the apartment than I do. I just wish she would run things by me first. I'm an architect, she's an editor and doesn't have that same designer eye which clearly shows. What really bothered me was that she started to throw some things away without asking. I went to take out the trash and saw that some birthday cards I kept were in there. When I asked about it, she said that she was just getting rid of clutter, but her stuff is more like clutter and mine has actual sentimental value. I told her to stop touching things in the apartment and she pointed out that she should have a say because she lives there which I agreed with, but she doesn't run anything by me. Now she's being very avoidant and passive aggressive. So am I the jerk? Everyone sucks here. You do realize that when you have a baby, your carefully curated apartment vibe will change very much, right? That said, she shouldn't be throwing your stuff out without asking you. Time to sit down, have an adult conversation, and come up with a compromise. Everyone sucks here. I would have said not the jerk if not for the I told her to stop touching things in my apartment. She has an equal say in what your space looks like and a right to make it feel like her home for her. She's the jerk for making changes without talking to you and especially for throwing some of your stuff out without your consent. You guys need to have a talk and reach a compromise. Did you go out of your way to make her feel like the home is hers when she moved in? It doesn't necessarily sound like that's the case. Everyone sucks here. Mostly you're the jerk though. It's not your apartment. It's shared now. There should be compromise even if it doesn't go with your vibe. Why should she ask if it's both of your spaces? The only reason I'm saying everyone sucks here is because she threw your cards away. That's not cool. She should have talked to you before throwing your things away. But you really need to figure out how to share space. Have you ever lived with anyone before? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. Reddit boy didn't mind when I added these cool new lights above our head. Please let us know if we should keep them in the comments. Karen didn't show up for work, so I fired her. I own a vape shop. We're a small business, only 12 employees. One of my employees, Peggy, was supposed to open yesterday. Peggy has recently been promoted to manager after two solid years of good work as a cashier. I really thought she could handle the responsibility. So I wake up, three hours after the place should be open, and I have 22 notifications on the store Facebook page. Customers have been trying to come shop, but the store is closed. Employees are showing up to work, but they're locked out. I call Peggy and get no response. I text her, same thing. So I go in and open the store. An hour before her shift was supposed to be over, she calls me back. I ask her if she's okay, and she says she needed to take a mental health day and do some self-care. I'm still pretty upset at this point, but I'm trying to be understanding, as I know how important mental health can be. So I ask her why she didn't call me as soon as she knew that she needed the day off. Her response, I didn't have enough spoons in my drawer for that. Frankly, I don't know what that means, but it seems to me like she's saying she cannot be trusted to handle the responsibility of opening the store in the AM. So I told her she had two choices. One, go back to her old position with her old pay. Two, I fire her completely. She's calling me all sorts of names now and says that I'm discriminating against her. None of this would have been a problem if she simply took two minutes to call out. I would have got up and opened the store on time, but this no-call, no-show crap is not the way to run a successful business. I think I might be the jerk here because I'm taking away her promotion over something she really had no control over, but at the same time, she really could have called me. So Reddit, I leave it to you. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is Peggy? Please let us know. After sitting here listening to Reddit boy every day for the past three years, I think I could use a day off myself. Entitled parents stole my meds and refused to give them back. I, 21 male, had a surgical removal of a cyst this afternoon. Mine had a pretty nasty infection, so it had to be removed ASAP. I went to the hospital with my fiance, 19 male, and my parents, who are 62 male and 57 female. 
Everything went very smoothly, thankfully, but as my parents were driving me and my fiancé back to our apartment, we got into a discussion about the medication I was prescribed. Now, my parents are paranoid when it comes to meds. I don't blame them. I'm aware that some can be addictive, and I'm wary of it myself. They straight up told me that I shouldn't take it at all and just take Tylenol and Ibuprofen. I told them I'd rather have the medication I was prescribed just in case my pain got bad once the hospital meds wore off. I wasn't allowed to drive after my surgery, so they were supposed to pick up my medication for me. Well, they did, but with two of my pills missing. Well, that's fishy and annoying. I texted my mom, basically asking where my meds went. She didn't respond, so I kind of forced it by telling her I'd have to report the pharmacist if it wasn't her. She said, I took the other two. And, I took them because that's all you can legally have and drive your fiancé to work tomorrow. Okay? Wow. I had set money aside for him to be able to get an Uber tomorrow if he needed to anyways, which she would have known had she talked to me about it or even brought up these concerns at all. I was upset. I texted this huge paragraph that was basically saying either give them back or I'm filing a police report, that stealing like this was a felony, that I understand her fear, but this was absolutely not the way to go about it. 40 minutes later, I get a, we're here, text and a pounding on my door. I waddle over and open and my parents are standing in the doorway, very upset. My dad starts talking about how it was absolutely not okay to threaten legal action and that I needed to apologize. He said it was his fault that no one talked to me about it, that he's sorry, but then goes on a five minute rant of how I have an addictive personality. I was a smoker when I was 18. How he's concerned for me, how he would never use the law against me, that the surgeon is giving them out like candy, and that he's heard a lot of cases of people getting addicted to these and didn't want to risk it. I said that being concerned wasn't the issue. He couldn't take away my say on the situation. He couldn't just steal from me just because he's scared. At the very least, he should discuss his concerns with me like an adult. He did not like that. He played this game of keep away with the bottle, holding it out to me and then yanking it away to say more to me. Just kept arguing. I got them back after a lot of fighting. Am I wrong here? I need to know if I overreacted. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. The fact that you think you might be means his gaslighting is working. They stole it from you, lied to you, and then tried to manipulate you and tried to punish you for your completely normal response. Not the jerk. Surgeons are absolutely not just handing these out like candy. In fact, many chronic pain patients are now having great difficulty getting meds due to the doctor's reluctance. Not the jerk. My mom did the same thing to me all the time because she would always worry. That's why I live with my dad now and he's never home, so I finally have the freedom I've always wanted. I'd go no contact with them if I were you. They obviously have no clue what they're talking about. Well, what do you think? Was Opie the jerk for threatening to call the cops or not? Please let us know. Sometimes parents mess around and find out. Insurance firm insists on direct billing? Okay then, have it your way. I may get some insurance related terms confused because I'm not knowledgeable about private insurance systems outside of my country, India. My cousin is Indian and lives in India and works for a major American cruise line. His usual schedule is nine months of work sailing around North America and three months of vacation time back in India. The maritime insurance company that he is insured with provides medical coverage for him. When he was on vacation in India, he tore his ACL and MCL and injured his meniscus playing football, soccer. It required a ligament reconstruction surgery and some months of rehab before he was fit to work again. There is public health care in India, but for something like knee ligament reconstruction, it still costs money although not as much as at private hospitals, and also takes time as there is a waiting list. So he decided to go private, which is costlier. So he went to an arthroscopic surgeon and got a letter from him detailing the estimated cost of the surgery, the date, and other relevant medical details. He emailed the details to the insurance company and they approved the surgery. Only one problem. They insisted on direct billing to the doctor. Now, doctors in India are familiar with direct billing but it's mostly with insurance companies that operate domestically in India. Naturally, the doctor was hesitant to accept the arrangement despite receiving a letter of guarantee from them. He simply wasn't convinced of the legal validity of a letter of guarantee from a foreign insurance company in India. What if they, for some reason, refuse to pay? He can't do anything about it. So at this point, my cousin stepped in and suggested to the company that he'll foot the bill up front and then submit a claim, after which the company can reimburse him. 
The insurance company seemed to agree at first, but this medical cost containment company they were partnered up with was vehemently opposed to the idea. They insisted on direct billing even though it didn't make a lick of difference in terms of cost. He tried convincing them that no doctor in India would accept this arrangement from a foreign insurance company, but they wouldn't relent. At last, he said forget this and went on a citywide search and finally found a top doctor in one of the most expensive hospitals in the city who was willing to operate on his knee with a letter of guarantee. The doctor also worked in three months of post-op physiotherapy costs into the surgery bill. The hospital had the best rooms, the best service, and the highest quality of care. The doctor worked with some of the top athletes in the country, and the final estimated cost was at least 700% more than the previous doctor. The insurance company didn't object and simply approved the surgery. He expected them to question the cost, but it was only around $8,000, which is the equivalent of like four ambulance rides in America. That must be a paltry sum for the company. At the end of the day, my cousin got the best care possible because of the insurance company's inexplicable insistence. Or maybe they had good reason, but they lost money at the end of the day. Edit. Everyone amazed at the $8,000 bill, let me tell you, it's a small amount for Americans, but it's still a big bill in India. A lot of Americans are flocking to India for surgeries for this particular reason. You receive great quality healthcare at some of the best hospitals here, and the end cost is almost a fraction of what you would end up paying in the US, and that's including for the flight tickets and hotel tickets at hotels like Hilton and Marriott. It's kind of depressing to admit that that price is actually more like two ambulance rides. If that. My son tried to refuse an ambulance ride because of cost. It was more than that for the single ride between hospitals. My brother had to have a ride for a non-emergency procedure between hospitals, different towns about 45 minutes apart. The first hospital refused to release him so my parents could take him to the other hospital. The ride was billed at over $10,000. Am I the jerk for telling a guy on the bus I'd rather he not sit next to me? I, 35, female. Commute into work in the city on Mondays and it's a three and a half hour trip. I normally sit near the front and there's always lots of extra seats open, including lots with open seats open so you don't need to sit next to anyone if you don't want to. I sit up front near the driver because it feels safer. Lots of people put their bags on the empty seat next to them and move them when someone asks to sit down. Previously, I always kept my bags on my lap while people were boarding and if no one sat next to me, I'd expand a bit. A few weeks ago, about 20 minutes into the trip, a guy gets up and asks, Do you mind if I sit here? I said no problem and he sat down. I'm catching up on work and he seems fine. Then he begins to manspread and starts consistently applying pressure to the armrest area. This is one of my pet peeves. I loathe having to make myself physically small so that other people, to be honest it's almost always men, can spread out like no one else is allowed to have personal space. But whatever, it's transit. It sucks, but so it goes. For the record, we're both fairly lean people. Neither of us appears to physically need to take up more than our allotted space. I didn't say anything, but I kept my legs and arms firmly on my armrest. Middle armrest, we each had one, refusing to budge. He kept giving me side eye, applying more pressure, etc. But eventually seemed to settle into just applying pressure. Annoying, but whatever. Once I had to get some water, and he immediately took over my armrest. When I was done, I made eye contact, to assert dominance, said, pardon me, he said sorry, and I got my armrest back. Pressure resumed. Annoying, but not enough for me to feel it was worth escalating or changing seats. Well, guess who takes this bus every Monday morning now? That's right, this guy. I started putting my bag down on the seat next to me until after he boards and then move it. I move it immediately and welcome anyone who asked to sit next to me during boarding time. Week two, he did ask once the bus had started into its route. I said no problem and then got up and went to sit somewhere else. He gave me an affronted look. I sat in another set of open double seats on the other side of the bus. Week four, he left me alone. Week five, he did the same post-boarding move. This time, there weren't any side-by-side -side seats where both were open, but there were lots of open single seats. This time, I said, I'm sorry. If you don't mind sitting in one of the other open seats, I'd really appreciate it. He glared at me, then started calling me all these mean names under his breath before going to sit somewhere else. At the destination, he caught up with me and said, You didn't have to be such a jerk, and stormed off. Normally, I never discourage people from sitting next to me when they ask, so maybe I'm the jerk for telling him no. I could have gotten up and moved to one of the open seats, 
but I just really didn't want to. Not the jerk. You should honestly report the behavior to the driver. He was purposely targeting you. Not the jerk. I wouldn't have felt comfortable sitting next to him for three and a half hours and there were other seats available. His reaction would make me want to get another bus. OP. I wish there was another bus or literally any other way to transit in. I'd happily pay a bit more for a train to get away from him, but they haven't restarted the normal morning train after cutting it off when ridership dropped two years ago. This happened to me once when I was 21. I was on an empty subway car and this guy came in and sat right next to me. So I started coughing really hard, just all over my stuff, really gross. He ended up getting up and moving to the next car. Not the jerk. He's being a creep. No one with good intentions specifically wants to sit next to the same person on public transit all the time. If he tries to interact with you again, I'd tell him that you're going to report his behavior to the bus company. Not the jerk. I'm guessing he has a crush on you and in his weird twisted reality thought this was some kind of weird flirting. He was upset because you made it clear to him that it isn't. His fragile ego was probably dented and he lashed out. Do you have the same regular bus driver? If so, I'd mention it to them so they can keep an eye on the situation. If not, you could report it to the company, but if you don't want to do that, just be on guard around him. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or the guy who kept trying to sit next to her? Please let us know. Dude probably thought they were going to start dating and get married and live happily ever after. <laughs> Am I the jerk for asking my girlfriend to not embarrass herself at dinner parties? My girlfriend had kind of a rough upbringing and now she turned out really successful. She's also probably the most self-confident and self-assured person I know, which I really admire, but just once in a while, she says stuff that's socially uncomfortable. For example, we were going to a dinner party and my friend kept apologizing for her messy car. My girlfriend said, Girl, I grew up in a hoarder house and I'm in the middle of shoveling garbage out of that house. There's nothing on earth that could disgust me anymore. And while that's true, it was kind of an uncomfortable overshare. Another time, her coworker was talking about how their kid was really shy and she didn't know how to help. My girlfriend was like, give her time, I'm sure she'll grow into herself. I didn't talk to anyone in school. Literally, I had no friends if you'll believe it. One last time, my girlfriend and I were at a networking event and one of my coworkers joked about how my girlfriend should enjoy grabbing thirds of a food when she's young because she can't eat like that forever. Without missing a beat, she said, oh, I don't think about food restriction like that anymore. It's an eating disorder trigger. Anyway, I'm trying to bulk up. Anyway, we had a big argument about it. We were invited to a dinner at my company's CEO's house this coming weekend along with a few peers. I asked her to not share anything uncomfortable there. She asked what I meant and I gave her the same examples. I told her that kind of shamelessness about stuff most people find shameful is awkward. She was like, but it's not really shameful. And renovating and flipping a house? So many of your coworkers talk about that. I said it wasn't the house flipping, it was the fact that it was her family home and it was a hoarder house and it was weird to shamelessly talk about having no friends. She was like, that stuff is in the past, why would I be insecure now? I got exasperated and asked her to just not share stuff that most people would be embarrassed to say at the dinner and she got angry and said that it sounded like I thought her whole life is embarrassing, so should she shut up? I said no, just talk about current stuff. Like you just got a promotion, traveled to Europe, bought your dream car. And she snapped at me. But I'm also still shoveling garbage every day. So it sounds like you're just embarrassed of me. Forget you for saying I should have more shame. I'm proud of myself. It sounds like you're the one who's ashamed. I'm still worried about how this dinner party will go. And I'm questioning whether I messed up by saying something. Am I the jerk for asking my girlfriend to not embarrass herself at a dinner party with my company's CEO? You're the jerk. Your girlfriend sounds like an emotionally intelligent woman relating to people in conversation. None of these are out of place for the topics. You might not like her saying it, but none of what you've described is weird or uncomfortable. She's right, you sound embarrassed by her past. I'm freelance and downsized, but I used to have a small amount of employees. If any one of them had a girlfriend at an event who spoke like this, I'd think she was straightforward, relatable, human, and sociable. None of that is shameful. You're the jerk. Sounds like you're extremely repressed and would be much better to find someone more your speed. Your girlfriend seems like too much of a free spirit and emotionally intelligent person. Find someone more emotionally stopped up like you. OP is hilarious. He's so insecure and clueless. It's hard to believe he didn't realize what he was writing as he posted. 
Girlfriend is a well-adjusted adult, secure, outgoing, and sounds delightful. She can do so much better. You're the jerk. Your girlfriend isn't shameless. She's talking about real life. She doesn't care what other people think about her. You, on the other hand, have a lot of growing up to do. You're embarrassing, honestly. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. If I were her, I'd let one rip at that dinner party and see how embarrassed he is then. <laughs> Am I the jerk for buying my daughter a new car for her 16th birthday without talking to my wife about it or buying new cars for my sons? I have four kids, Lucas, who's 24, Jace, 22, Henry, 17, and Katie, 16. When Katie was born, I was very worried that we might end up favoring and spoiling her since she's our only daughter and youngest. I tried my best to never show favoritism and always treat my kids equally, but it turned out the opposite of what I expected. My wife clearly favors our sons. I tried everything. I talked to her, tried therapy, asked her parents to talk to her, showed her research about the negative side effects of favoritism, but nothing worked. I helped them buy a car. They each had to save money and I would double the money they have saved and buy a car with it. We also have a tradition that the birthday boy or birthday girl will choose all the plans for that day, where we go, what we eat, etc. That was also the plan for Katie's birthday. On the day of Katie's birthday, Henry had a basketball game and my wife told us she wants to go with Henry instead of coming with us to celebrate Katie's birthday because apparently it was an important game. Henry told her she doesn't have to come, but she insisted she wanted to be there. We argued over this, but she ended up going there and Jace went with them as well. I asked Katie what she wants to do, but she bursted out crying and said she doesn't want to do anything. Lucas went to her room and talked to her and finally convinced her to come with us, but she refused to choose what to do and she was silent the whole time, so I did the only thing I knew would make her happy. I took her to a car shop and told her she can choose whatever she wants and I'll pay for it and she gets to keep all the money she has saved. It really improved her mood. She chose a car and then we went to her favorite restaurant. Then they left me and went out together because apparently they wanted some sibling time and I'm too old for what they wanted to do. When she came back home, she seemed very happy and told me she loved her birthday. When my wife heard about it, she got mad at me and said I had no right to buy a car without talking to her and it's not fair that Katie got a new car for free when our sons had to save money for a used car. I know it was probably wrong to do this, but it made Katie happy and Lucas thinks I did right. Not the jerk. You're making up for the lack of effort on your wife's part. She can be mad all she wants. If she had been there, then maybe you could have talked to her, but she wasn't. I'm glad your kiddo had a good 16th birthday and I hope this doesn't cause too many issues in the family. It's already causing a lot of issues. That basketball game wasn't the most important game of his life. Her daughter literally burst out crying because of her awful mother's favoritism. Hopefully OP's daughter goes no contact with her mother and realizes she missed out on a good relationship with her one and only daughter. Not the jerk. Man, I really wanted to say you're the jerk because that's a big decision to make without asking your partner. But given that you walked into a dealership and said, pick a car, it's on me, I'm assuming you have some degree of serious money, so we'll go with the assumption that's not an issue. Not the jerk, but I would maybe like talk to your sons, who seem innocent in all of this, about why you did it, and maybe do something nice for them too. Speaking of cars, if you could have any car right now for free, which one would you choose? Please let us know. Just give me a DeLorean so my life can be complete. I would like a raise, and time off, and... I want to start this off by clarifying that this is not my story. It's the story of someone very close to me and I will leave out a large amount of specific detail because quite a bit of the info is not mine to reveal. The build up to the revenge is that this person had a horrible employer. She worked HR and managed payroll at what was effectively a nursing home. I don't know if they call themselves that, but it's what they are. The company had a bit of a good old boys club going on, with all of the highest level management being older men who all did less work and got more pay than pretty much everyone else. There were regular complaints from women who worked there and many women were fired for absolutely absurd reasons, followed by their male coworkers getting raises. That in and of itself was bad, but it's not what instigated the need for revenge. What caused the burning desire to get back at the company was when the company fired my friend's manager, who was a woman, because she took a week off after literally breaking a leg badly. The HR department was already badly understaffed 
so my friend had to take on the responsibilities of this manager without any pay bonus. She requested a pay bonus multiple times, denied each time. A month or so later, the company hires a new manager to replace the old one at nearly twice the salary. The new manager is an older man. I'm not entirely sure what this guy actually did during the day because my friend continued to do all of the managerial tasks and she knows that for a fact because the guy's account didn't have access to the systems he needed access to and he never asked for that access. For six months, my friend showed this manager issues with their system, including payroll, and explained that she was not only the only employee who knew how to use the payroll system, but she was the only one with access to it. The jerk ignored her and made regular comments about how she was replaceable and useless. One day, she lost it. She set up a bot with her credentials to automatically assign her pay each pay period, according to her actual salary, so not stealing or anything. She then carefully plans her next move and puts in her two-week notice, right before a large department-wide week off, and right before her only coworker has a two-week vacation. She wouldn't have time to train the coworker, even if the coworker was in the country. The manager still dismissed her, thinking he could just hire someone who knew what they were doing. Little did he know, she had tweaked with the payroll software over her time there. Nothing super awful, but it was very different from what the base software was. She was the only person who knew how to properly use it and the only person in the whole company, including the CEO, who had access to the necessary numbers to actually run the payroll. When she leaves, after the two weeks, the company has two whole pay periods where they do not pay their employees. They can't. But my friend still gets paid because they never disabled her automatic payment thing. They couldn't. Eventually, they called her and basically begged her to consult with them on their payroll. For the past six months, she's been paid $250 an hour for five hours a week to run the company's payroll, fully remote, even though it was an in-person job before. And to top it all off, she doesn't even actually work the five hours. She wrote a script on her personal device to process payroll for her. She just has to press one button. She's working another job now, but wow, they really messed around and found out. Am I the jerk for refusing to change my diet for my wife? My wife, 27 female, and I, 29 male, have been married for six years. I work as a Python developer. My wife is a stay-at-home mom to our four-year-old son. For the past year, I've been trying to incorporate more exercise since I'm having a lot of back pain, muscle cramps, difficulty climbing stairs, etc., basically because of my sedentary job. So now I do swimming early in the morning and in the evening for one and a half hours each and every day, totaling three hours of swimming. I also do yoga every morning before swimming. As a result of this, I'm feeling extremely hungry almost all the time. As per my exercise routine, I should eat about 4,500 to 5,000 calories per day. Most often, I eat a bowl of oatmeal and boil eggs for breakfast, egg and cheese sandwiches for morning snack, ham and cheese sandwiches, and a hearty soup for lunch, a milkshake made with honey, almonds, any fruit, flaxseed, coconut milk, and coconut oil for afternoon snack, and pasta and grilled meat for dinner. I also have dessert, ice cream or a brownie at night if I'm still hungry. My wife recently was told by her doctor that if she doesn't start putting effort to lose weight, there was high health risk. She was put on a strict diet of about 1,500 calories a day, along with gradually increasing exercise. She's been finding it really hard to stick to her diet because she misses the food that she used to eat before. She told me a few days ago that I should follow the same diet as her, but eat more portions. She said that she feels tempted by the food I eat. I suggested to her that she speak to her therapist about this because I have very different health requirements from her, but she thinks I'm being selfish by not supporting her in weight loss journey. The thing is, I need to eat insane portions of food if I just eat veggies, fruits, and lean meat because my calorie requirement is way higher than hers. My wife is refusing to talk to me, saying that I'm a terrible husband for not helping her. I asked her if me eating in my workroom and not bringing the food into the other areas would help her feel less tempted, but she said just knowing that there's food that she shouldn't eat in the house, she'll feel tempted. Am I the jerk? Edit. I do childcare while I'm working from home, so our son plays sitting next to me while I work. She just has to make breakfast and lunch for him, and we have a 50-50 chore split, so she can do what she likes after feeding him and doing her share of chores. I work full time, but I don't have a stressful job, so I can still do chores and childcare at home while working. Not the jerk. She's being very unreasonable. Why is her diet more important than yours? 
I agree that she should talk with a therapist about being tempted by other food. That's not your fault or responsibility. Not the jerk. She should absolutely speak to a dietitian as well as her therapist because cravings are her problem. She can be tempted just walking out in the world watching people eat a donut or having a venti iced caramel macchiato, but they shouldn't all stop and eat what she needs to eat. You can encourage her and support her in her journey, but it doesn't involve you just eating identically so she doesn't feel tempted. Not the jerk. Diets, weight loss, weight gain, exclusion, etc. can be tricky business and often play havoc with the emotions of the dieter. There's a lot of self tied up in favorite foods and meals with family and partners, even without things like changing energy levels or hunger pains. When there is tasty, energy-rich food being cooked and eaten in the house, it's going to be a little vexing. However, once she turns it into you being a terrible husband for not supporting her weight loss journey without recognizing that she's trying to shift your fitness journey, she becomes the jerk. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Reddit boy doesn't complain when I put him on my cottage cheese diet. Do you, Reddit boy? Help me. Do whatever and figure it out later? Roger that. I had a reverse situation like this. In my biology class, we had to do group presentations on diseases. My group had COPD. I was paired up with two others, Alex and Valerie. Valerie was the typical loudmouth bully, not in an American cheerleader sense, but in a please don't slam me against a wall intimidating way. Alex was the quiet best friend of the popular guys, nice enough in general, but lazy to the core. In my country, people get divided into academic levels at age 11, and they both have been in the top levels, so they were book smart to some degree. I, however, had purposefully chosen to go down a level because of my mental health, so I was a perfectionist and they knew it. Right when we got told to start working on it, they just kept ignoring me and chatting with their friends. When I asked them how would they know what to present to the class if they didn't research it all, they basically told me to just do whatever and we'll figure it out. So I did. I typed out an entire research document, multiple pages of notes and references, anything and all I could find on COPD that I could understand, and converted that into a comprehensive, beautifully designed PowerPoint presentation. When presentation D-Day had arrived, I turned up to class well prepared, printouts and USB drive in Easter pack bag, ready to wow the class. The other two soon came to me asking what the game plan was, as they hadn't even as much as typed the word into Google. I told them not to worry, I had thought of everything, and I wasn't lying. When my group got called, I confidently walked to the front of the class, my teammates in tow sweating. Dear Mr. Bean, he looked like his twin with an even bigger mole, and class, my presentation is about COPD. I will be presenting it as Valerie and Alex refuse to cooperate with me on this project. I will, immediately followed by the class erupting in, oh, reactions, total confused stutters and yells from the two next to me, and the teacher looking at the duo bewildered. Is that so, Alex? Valerie? When the two couldn't even answer what the topic was, they immediately tried blaming me for excluding them but the teacher had witnessed their little tea parties happening during class, so he told us to drop the presentation and to each send in our own individual research documents as a replacement task. I already had them ready to go. No one ever tried to mess with me during assignments after that again. My ex-wife, Karen, refuses to let our kids have pets. I'm divorced, six years, and remarried two years. I have two sons with my ex, who are 11 and 13, both male. My wife has one son who's nine, male. My kid's mom lives less than a mile away. It's close enough for the kids to walk over, but far enough to be separate space. My boys move back and forth between their moms and my house usually once a week. We're flexible, especially during the summer because of travel, kid activities, etc. My wife's son lives with us full time. My wife and I have been talking with the kids about getting a pet that they would personally be responsible for at our house. This has been going on since December, and we told the kids we would finally get the pets when all of our summer travel was done. Since then, the kids have been excited about the prospect of having their own pets. We asked them to research their chosen pet, determine what its needs were and what kind of common health problems that kind of pet could have, and how to avoid them. The kids all presented their reports and did an awesome job starting out as responsible pet owners. My kids started thinking about how they would take care of their pets when they were with their mom. We presented their options as we saw them. Come over from time to time. Ask for help from someone that's here all the time. 
bring the pets back and forth. They decided they would like it best if they could bring their pets back and forth between the houses. We said that it would be okay with us, but they had to talk to their mom about it. I let them know that it was their responsibility to initiate that conversation. Two weeks ago, I reach out to my ex to see what her answer is regarding the pets moving back and forth. She lets me know how the kids approach that conversation saying, Dad says we can bring the pets back and forth. I apologize and let her know that that wasn't my intent. I clarify that we're fine with any of their three options for caring for these pets. She replies, in concept, I don't disagree with it. And also later in the conversation, it's totally unfair to expect me to secondarily be responsible for these pets. I'm confused, but leave that conversation feeling certain that she doesn't want to participate. So I decide that I will take care of the pets while the boys are away. Yesterday, we bought the youngest two their pets. They are ecstatic and it's adorable how they're caring for them. I get an angry message from my ex stating that the purchase of their pets is an imposition on them, regardless of whether they go to their house or not. And a bit of patronizing, I understand that you and your wife are excited about having an autonomous family unit of your own, but you continually make decisions together in a vacuum that impact the wider scope of immediate family, and it's really not okay. Am I the jerk for buying these pets without her approval? Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.